as of others. Compliance with existing safety equipment and training requirements is spotty, and guidance documents such as BIC's Trade Waste Safety Manual lack the force of law. The current commercial waste system fails to provide much needed transparency and fairness to customers. More than half of contracts are simple oral agreements, and many payments are made in person and in cash. Compliance with BIC's rate cap relies on self-reporting by carters and customers, resulting in efforts by some to evade these requirements. City regulations require all businesses to recycle and certain establishments to separate organics. But our commercial recycling diversion rate of less than 30% lags behind our peers. Businesses that comply with the law and separate recyclable materials lack assurances from carters that these materials are actually collected separately and recycled. City inspectors regularly witness trucks dump mixed refuse and recyclables at transfer stations, and carters and businesses regularly deflect blame on each other for failed recycling practices. The current system discourages carters and customers from making investments to help move toward a zero waste future. In studying the industry and hearing from stakeholders and advocates all over the city, we consistently heard that the system is broken and that the city can and should do more to fix it. After over two years of public engagement and internal analysis, we are presented with evidence of a commercial waste collection industry that is unsafe, unfair, and unsustainable. I'll now describe the extensive public outreach and stakeholder engagement process that we undertook to develop the city's plan to address the problems in this industry. In the course of developing our plan, DSNY held more than 150 meetings with more than 200 stakeholders, including council members, commercial businesses from all five boroughs and all 20 proposed zones, labor unions, advocates, carters, elected officials, and many others. These meetings took a variety of formats, including one-on-one -on -one interviews, small group conversations, field interviews, focus groups, and an advisory board of 40 diverse stakeholders convening quarterly. In November 2018, the city released its comprehensive implementation plan. Since then, we have been conducting a detailed environmental review of the proposed plan. As part of this process, the department released a draft generic environmental impact statement studying the potential environmental impacts of the plan. We received public comments and held three public meetings. The department continues to conduct a vigorous and varied public outreach process to strengthen its plan for implementation of commercial waste zones in New York City. The concept behind commercial waste zones is simple. Instead of up to 50 carters, carters operating in a single neighborhood on a nightly basis, there will just be a few. These companies will be selected through a competitive solicitation process that will identify the carters that can provide excellent service with the highest standards at low prices for each area. The resulting contracts will include standards for pricing, customer service, safety, environmental health, and requirements to promote the city's zero waste and sustainability goals. With fewer trucks on the streets and shorter routes, zone collection will also mean improved traffic and air quality and less unsafe driving behavior and worker fatigue. Okay, on the next slide uh, shows a typical route today. To fill up one truck, it goes through four boroughs in New Jersey. Under the proposed plan, the same number of customers would be serviced within the boundaries of the zone, making it much shorter. I mean, that, the before picture, I think, tells it all. Next one. As indicated in the next slide, Citywide, our proposed system will dramatically reduce truck traffic associated with this industry by 50%, eliminating more than 18 million miles of truck traffic from New York City streets every year, while maintaining high quality and low cost service to New York City businesses. It will be safer, fairer, and more sustainable than the system that operates today. 18, 18 million miles. 18 million vehicle miles less travel. And do, do you mind going back to the previous slide? I just wanted to make sure that People saw what 
what some folks would consider an efficient route on the left before um, is the case that they were making before we got the study. And now that we have the data and the information, to be able to see it side by side really makes a big impact. So I'm glad that you put this slide together and it was one of the things you presented is it just shows, I wanna be clear, that's my community, that's community board one, where we handle 40% of the city's trash. And look at the difference that a zone system could do. So I appreciate yeah. that slide. Yes, and it, I mean, it shows a truck going through four boroughs and New Jersey to collect one, one route. I just don't see the case that could possibly be made. Thank you. Our plan divides the city into 20 geographic zones, as, as indicated in the slide that's up now, with between three and five carters through, uh, that would be selected through a competitive procurement process to operate within each zone. Most zones would have three carters, but a few denser, more concentrated districts, such as Midtown Manhattan, could have up to five carters under our plan. The competitive procurement will ensure that the selected carters would be those able to provide a competitive price while also meeting and exceeding standards for service, safety, infrastructure investment, and efficiency, while demonstrating a strong commitment to our zero waste goals. Commercial waste zones will apply only to the collection of commercial refuse, recyclables, and source-separated organic waste. It will exclude specialized or intermittent waste streams, such as construction and demolition debris, medical waste, and other types of waste that will continue to be collected and managed under existing city and state regulations. Carters that win zone contracts will be obligated to meet certain contractual requirements aligned with the city's program goals and objectives. This approach will standardize the contracting process for customers by requiring, by requiring written service agreements between carters and customers, uh, requiring transparent monthly bills, and by making the pricing structure more transparent. Under the city's plan, each carter will be able to compete for as few as one or as many as 20 zones but no carter will be able to win contracts for more than 15. Selected carters will be awarded 10-year contracts with city options for two five-year extensions. The department will select carters based on a request for proposals, which will outline minimum qualifications and scoring criteria. The selection process will be fair, rigorous, and unbiased, designed to select the carters that put forth their best overall proposal. While detailed pricing and service agreements will be negotiated between individual businesses and carters, DSNY will negotiate rate caps for each carter through the contract award process. Under our plan, carters will be required to comply with all existing laws and regulations. In addition to the contract requirements, DSNY will have mechanisms to ensure compliance with these laws and regulations if carters fail to comply. DSNY and BIC will work as partners in both the implementation of commercial waste zones and in regulating the awardees and designated carters under such a system. Awardees must have a BIC license in good standing, and BIC will continue to conduct background investigations on all carters to ensure that they possess the requisite good character, honesty, and integrity. DSNY and BIC will have co-enforcement authority to issue administrative violations for commingling recyclables, unauthorized collection in a zone, interference with the commercial waste zone program and in any other rules that the city promulgates in the future. In addition to creating an efficient, rational system to collect commercial waste, our plan for commercial waste zones also sets out to achieve a number of related program goals. As previously mentioned, the documented safety issues associated with the private hauling industry demand action. New York City's residents expect and deserve safe streets. Commercial waste zones will support the city's ongoing work to eliminate deaths and serious injuries on New York City streets under Vision Zero. During the solicitation process, carters will be evaluated, in part based on health and safety plans submitted as well as their safety record in previous years. Promoting the public safety within the commercial waste industry begins with worker safety. Our plan requires that carters provide safety and training programs to build a culture of safety within the commercial waste industry and ensure that workers know how to perform their jobs safely. Specifically, carters will be required to provide a minimum of 40 hours of worker safety, safety training to all drivers and helpers that collect waste on city streets. But we all know that training alone is not enough. 
the choices that companies make regarding how long their drivers are expected to work and under what conditions have a real-world impact. With fewer trucks on the streets and shorter routes, zone collection service will reduce incentives for unsafe working conditions, such as placing drivers on 14-hour shifts on long, circuitous routes just to fill up a truck. This will reduce the risks of unsafe driving behavior and worker fatigue and lead to a healthier, safer city. The department will also receive and take appropriate action in response to all whistleblower complaints, including anonymous complaints. We will establish a displaced employee list and require that every carter utilize city programs that promote hiring from local communities. New York City has set an ambitious goal of sending zero waste to landfills. While we have primarily focused on the role that city residents play in this effort, businesses, businesses have an equally important role in helping to achieve this goal. Under this plan, all carters that provide service within commercial waste zones will be required to provide recycling collection to the businesses they serve and organics collection to businesses that request it. And they must do so at a discount when compared to refuse collection services. As part of the solicitation process, carters will submit zero waste plans and identify innovative practices to support waste reduction, reuse, and recycling. Carters will also be required to provide third-party waste audits to customers at no charge to help them identify opportunities to save money and reduce waste. New York City is a leader in fighting climate change and reducing harmful air pollution that affects the health of its residents and the environment. One NYC, the city's blueprint for building a strong and fair city, calls for substantial reductions in greenhouse gas emissions to achieve carbon neutrality by 2050. Establishing commercial waste zones is an important step toward this goal. Our analysis shows that annual vehicle miles traveled associated with commercial waste collection would be decreased by 50 percent, even after accounting for new truck routes to collect some additional recycling and organics that would be diverted. This reduction in traffic would lead to commensurate reductions of emissions of all kinds, including greenhouse gases, particulate matter, and other air pollutants. Reducing truck traffic associated with commercial waste collection will also lead to co-benefits in other areas. Fewer trucks means less nighttime noise, less roadway wear and tear, and improved quality of life in neighborhoods across New York City. Businesses in New York City demand and deserve consistent, responsive, and dependable service. Commercial waste zones will provide low, fair, transparent pricing for large and small businesses, while strengthening minimum standards for customer service. Carters will be required to provide written service agreements to all of their customers outlining rates and any fees so businesses that only pay for the waste they produce. Our plan also preserves competition and customer choice by allowing businesses to select, to select from up to three to five qualified carters in each zone. The city will outline baseline customer service standards in the RFP that will be included in all contracts between carters and the customers. Minimum requirements will include an itemized monthly billing statement, customer service hotline, and a website. Additionally, carters will submit customer service plans in their proposals to detail how they will implement customer service support, performance metrics, communication tools, and other community benefits. This approach also provides an exciting opportunity for the city to prioritize investments in waste management inf infrastructure on two fronts, resilient, sustainable, and equitable infrastructure and safe, reliable fleets. Through the competitive solicitation process, the city will require carters to submit a waste management plan for all waste and recyclables collected from customers. This plan will outline the transfer, processing, and final disposal locations for all materials collected. The city will evaluate these waste management plans based on the principles of sustainability, reliability, and equity. Safe modern fleets are key to creating a robust and sustainable commercial waste collection system, and carters will be required to maintain a fleet that is safe and capable of performing all applicable collection services for their customers. Proposers that seek to invest in infrastructure and technologies that promote program goals, including clean vehicles, safety, technology, and sustainable waste management facilities will receive favorable consideration during the selection process. I will now turn to the bill under consideration today. 
Intro 1574 largely reflects a plan for commercial waste zones that I just described. We are generally supportive of this legislation and are eager to work with the Council to enact a local law that will establish a safe and efficient waste collection system that improves the quality of life for all New Yorkers, that works for the city's local businesses, and that supports the city's short and long-term goals for a cleaner, safer, and more sustainable city. However, the administration has concerns about one important difference between the introduced bill and the plan I described. Intro 1574, as introduced, limits the department to selecting just one carter per zone. Having just one carter in each zone rather than three to five carters would achieve only marginal environmental improvement with a truck travel reduction about eight percentage points higher than the non-exclusive plan but would lead to far greater disruption to an industry vital to the health and safety of our city and its customers. Only a few large carters operating today have the resources and capital to viably compete to be the sole service provider for any such zone. In an exclusive system, nearly all small and medium-sized carters would automatically be wiped out. In the four years that we have taken to study this industry and develop our plan, we spoke to scores of customers and business groups. The message from these groups is clear. Choice matters. Customers demand high quality and responsive service, and they want to be able to fire their carter if the service does not meet their needs. An exclusive zone model would create a monopoly within each zone, eliminating businesses' leverage and creating a lopsided power dynamic between carter and customer. In this monopolistic system, carters would have no incentive to offer less than the maximum price and without pressure from regulated competition, service quality would suffer. The city's plan preserves the element of choice, albeit in a more organized fashion than exists today. Some businesses would prefer we keep the current system despite its very real costs and externalities, such as air and noise pollution from excess truck traffic. But as I hope you will hear from many of them today, the city's plan reflects years of engagement, of listening and reflection and it seeks to achieve a balance between serving the needs of customers and achieving the other program goals that I have described. Lastly, creating an exclusive zone system puts a far greater burden on the city and the department to regulate individual service agreements and resolve disputes. While our non-exclusive approach allows customers to fire their carter if the service is not up to par, in an exclusive system, the city would be forced to mediate each and every claim. And if a carter failed to provide adequate service to customers in a zone or pulls out of a zone altogether, the department would step in to provide service until a replacement could be procured. In a non-exclusive system, the city would more freely impose contractual remedies on bad actors, including potentially termination for cause, knowing that other qualified carters could quickly step in to provide the service afterward. The department knows very well the challenges that come with removing thousands of tons of waste from our streets every day. New York City's businesses, small and large, must have high quality, dependable waste collection services at a predictable cost. The adoption of commercial waste zones represents the most significant reform of New York City's commercial waste industry since the creation of the Trade Waste Commission in the 1990s. And it is a transformative step forward that will improve health and safety in our communities and for workers in the industry. The department looks forward to working with the council to build a successful commercial waste zones policy through continued stakeholder participation and public input. We are committed to designing a system that simultaneously improves quality of life for New Yorkers and meets the needs of both the business community and the waste collection industry. I want to thank the sponsors of this legislation and the other bills under consideration today for their ongoing partnership in these efforts. Moreover, I want to thank the activists, organizers, and other stakeholders, many of whom are here today, for their important work over the last several years to help shape the plan for commercial waste zones and for helping to craft this historic piece of legislation. I will now turn over the microphone to Commissioner Janelle to address the remaining bills, after which we will be happy to answer your questions. Good morning, Chair Reynoso and the other members of the City Council's Committee on Sanitation and Solid Waste Management and other members of the Council. My name is Noah Janelle and I am the Commissioner and Chair of the New York City Business Integrity Commission. With me at the table today is Executive Agency Council Emily Anderson 
and my colleagues from the New York City Department of Sanitation. Thank you for inviting us to testify at today's hearing regarding seven bills relating to New York City's trade waste industry. This is an important time for BIC and for the city as a whole. BIC's mission is growing. Today, the focus in the trade waste industry cannot be solely on organized crime and corruption. That must always be an essential part of our mission, but we must also seek to protect the people who live in, work in, and visit New York City in other ways, particularly as they travel through our streets. Intro number 1573 will help us do that. My testimony today will focus on the BIC specific bills at issue at this hearing, and then I will briefly discuss intro number 1574 relating to commercial waste zones. The Business Integrity Commission was created by local law in 1996 under the name the Trade Waste Commission. Its mission was and still is to free the trade waste hauling industry from the grip of organized crime and other types of corruption. Trade waste, for those unfamiliar with the term, is essentially commercial garbage or waste and recyclable materials. It can be the common waste and recyclables that come from stores and restaurants, or it can be construction and demolition debris from construction sites. If you haul it from a location in New York City, you need a license or registration from BIC. BIC also regulates the public wholesale food markets in the city. For the past 23 years, BIC has fought with significant success against organized crime and other criminality in the industries it regulates. That fight is far from over and we remain vigilant. We are also diligently preparing for the January 1st, 2020 deadline set by Local Law 145 of 2013, the Trade, Will Trade Waste Vehicle Emissions Law. We have a hearing pursuant to the Citywide Administrative Procedure Act, or CAPA, scheduled for next month on rules relating to trade waste unions as we prepare to start registering them as required by Local Law 55 of 2019. And among other things, we continue to enforce the rules that prohibit the practice of commingling commercial waste with both recyclables and organics. As you can see, we're a small agency with a great deal of responsibility. As always, we urge the members of the Sanitation and Solid Waste Committee and other members of the City Council, as well as members of the trade waste industry and the public in general, to tell us if you are aware of a company violating our rules and regulations. Historically, safety has not been BIC's mandate or focus. There are many other agencies that have a hand in public safety. Of course, the New York City Police Department is the first agency you think of when you think about protecting people on the streets of New York. The New York City, state, and federal departments of transportation also play major roles in traffic safety. We have been working closely with all of those agencies and many others over the last several years as BIC has taken on a larger role in promoting safety in the trade waste industry. In 2016, BIC joined the Vision Zero Task Force. Through that task force, we have strengthened our relationships with many of our sister agencies as we work together to improve traffic safety in the trade waste industry. As a result of that work, we established BIC's Interagency Collision Review Panel last year. The panel meets quarterly and brings together members of several city agencies, NYPD, DOT, TLC, DCAS, and DSNY, to review fatal crashes in the city that involved a trade waste truck. We want to learn from those crashes and determine whether there is something that can be done to prevent similar crashes in the future. In 2018, we issued our Trade Waste Safety Manual and promulgated new rules that require our licensees and registrants to report to BIC on events such as crashes and also required them to increase their insurance coverage. But we were constrained by our limited authority in the administrative code from issuing new safety standards in the industry. Intro number 1573 can help change that. Perhaps most importantly, intro 1573 would give BIC the power and duty to establish and enforce environmental safety and health standards, including traffic safety requirements for trade waste vehicles. BIC will be able to establish new rules in the industry in areas such as driver training and certification, equipment on trucks, and other issues. While we still must be careful of preemption issues when promulgating rules, 
we will now have greater latitude to create new standards in the industry and enforce them. As a corollary to that power, BIC would expressly be empowered to deny, revoke, or suspend a license or registration for failure to comply with any city, state, or federal law, rule, or regulation relating to traffic safety or the collection, removal, transportation, or disposal of trade waste in a safe manner. Collecting and hauling trade waste is an inherently dangerous job. Where there is a company that demonstrates a pattern of behavior that creates a danger to the public, we will now have more tools to help address that problem. But with respect to intro number 1575 regarding additional penalties to be issued to trade waste companies for their driver's violations of the New York vehicle and traffic law, there may be legal concerns that we have to work through as the bill moves forward. Regarding intro number 1611, which relates to DSNY permitted transfer stations, BIC supports increased coordination between BIC and DSNY on transfer stations, which are a critical part of the trade waste industry. BIC will com continue to communicate with DSNY on transfer stations and is also conducting a full review of the ownership of all transfer stations in the city. Where BIC sees an issue, it will recommend action for DSNY to take. With respect to the unions at the transfer stations, BIC has not dealt with those unions and has not gained expertise in this area, and we look forward to working with Council to ensure BIC has the proper tools to regulate this industry. Additionally, the Law Department is reviewing the bill to see if there are any legal concerns. BIC supports the principle in intro number 1082 of requiring GPS in trade waste trucks but would like to work with the council to find an appropriate scope for the requirement. This bill makes sense in the context of commercial waste zones and DSNY accepting the information and processing it. As currently drafted, intro number 1082 applies to all trade waste vehicles that are registered with BIC. That is approximately 7,500 vehicles and includes not only large packer trucks and dump trucks, but also pickup trucks and other smaller vehicles. It applies to all BIC licensees and registrants, including self-haulers, many of whom are landscapers. The cost to the industry would be significant, and the administrative burden on BIC would be massive. BIC does not have an IT infrastructure capable of accepting and analyzing what would surely be a massive amount of data from those 7,500 trucks. Intro number 1083 would set a specific range for penalties for failure to disclose employees to the commission in license applications. BIC already issues administrative violations for non-disclosure of employees, but intro number 1083 removes BIC's discretion as to what the penalty is. Currently, BIC's response to non-disclosure of information can range from a low-level penalty up to the denial of an application. Where the non-disclosure appears to be inadvertent or the result of a misunderstanding, BIC generally has imposed lesser fines and at times has given a warning. Toward the other end of the spectrum, fines can be steeper, up to $10,000 based on a number of factors, including the licensee's record of compliance with BIC's rules. And where an applicant has intentionally failed to disclose a principal or a key employee, BIC has denied a license or registration application. While BIC recognizes the Council's intent in intro number 1084A, which would require a minimum of three employees per trade waste truck or the maximum number of employees that can physically accompany each vehicle, this bill has a number of issues. As best addressed by DSNY, there are a number of operational issues that this bill raises, such as the fact that some operations, such as driving a roll-off truck, can safely be accomplished with one person. Lastly, I will turn to intro number 1574, which is the commercial waste zone legislation. BIC supports this DSNY-led effort to transform the system in New York City for hauling putrescible commercial waste, in other words, the run-of-the-mill commercial garbage and recyclables that every business generates and must hire a carting company to take away. We stand ready to be a supportive partner in this effort to help ensure the integrity of the companies operating in the new structure and their compliance with all related rules, regulations, and other requirements. 
This package of bills has the power to change the commercial carding industry in New York City for the better. From BIC's perspective, we are looking forward to working together with you, Chair Reynoso, and the rest of the Sanitation and Solid Waste Management Committee, and all of our other partners to make New York City's carding industry safer, cleaner, more efficient, and more transparent. Now I'm glad to answer any questions you have. Thank you for your testimony, and I just want to acknowledge that uh, we were joined by Councilmember Cohen Vallone and are joined currently by Councilmember Aspinall. Um, Vallone and Cohen have gone to another hearing and are coming right back because they have some questions. Uh, but uh, I want to start, can we please put the slide, and I want to stay with the slide, that shows the route that goes through New Jersey? That one. So uh, just leave that there. I think that that's important that we continue to see uh, about the concept of what we're trying to do here is accomplish efficiencies uh, in vehicles miles traveled at a minimum to you know uh, contribute to the safe uh, saving our environment and uh, cutting back uh, and making sure that climate change is something we address in a meaningful way in the city of New York. On top of that, we have other things outside of environmental issues that are worker safety. Um, and uh, recycling rates being increased and so forth that we want to make sure that we can achieve. Uh, but I do want to ask you a couple of questions about the current market. Um, what is the market share like? So you said we have about 90 businesses. Uh, I wanted to know of those 90 businesses, um, the top 20, for example, businesses or the, tw the 20 carding companies that haul the most trash in the city of New York, what is their market share overall in the city of New York. I want people to, and myself, to be able to grasp the concept of who's doing the work in the city of New York now. Okay. Um, first, I just wanted to thank uh, the council again for having this hearing on this very important legislation. I think it's a tremendous win for all New Yorkers. It will result in less air pollution, less noise pollution, 18 million miles of truck traffic saved, enhanced public safety, and improved employee safety. Uh, to answer your specific question, um, I'm going to defer to Justin Bland, who is the Director of Commercial Waste and who has spent nearly four years working on this plan, uh, so he can better answer that question. Yes, thank you. Um, so to answer your question, uh, there are about 250 companies that are licensed by BIC uh, to handle all types of trade waste, including putrescible waste. Uh, of those 250 that could be doing this activity, there are approximately 90 uh, that regularly collect the type of waste that we're talking about regulating. Um, so of those 90 companies, those range from uh, large international, uh, or one large international company, um, some multi-state operations, uh, down to one and two truck operators. Um, so it's a spread. Um, the largest company has about 15% of the market share. Um, so one company has 15% of the market share right now. That's right. Okay. Um, that's roughly 15,000 customers. There's another couple of companies with over 10,000 customers. Uh, and, and I'd say there's about 10 companies with uh, a few thousand to seven or 8,000. Uh, and there are many, many companies uh, with less than a thousand. So when I talk about market share, sure. can, so, can you help me come? There's a lot of numbers you threw out there. It seems like you have a one, every 1,000 companies equals 1% 1 of businesses in the city of New York because you said 15,000 companies. To use round 15%. numbers, yeah, there's 100,000 customers. All right, so, um, help me, so help me out here. So the top 20 companies, to directly answer your question, the top 20 companies handle about 80% of the market share. So, so for the the public hearing here and the folks paying attention. So there seems to already be a consolidation that has happened uh, within the trade waste industry where the top 20 companies of 90, or we can say maybe 20, uh, what is that, 25% of the companies account for 80% of the business um, in the city of New York already. Is that a fair statement to be, to be made? Yeah, it is, it's a consolidated industry. So the 70 companies that do about 20% of the city's trash, so there's a 70 percent of the 70 companies that are left over only do 20 percent of the city's work. Right, and keep in mind that there's other types of waste that that these companies are probably doing as well, like hauling construction debris or right, doing clear right. out something. Like Understood. That. So, so we have a a, uh, a conversation that's being had and a point that's being made made about choice. 
But it seems like the city of New York has chosen to do work with mostly 20 businesses already, 20 carters, is the choice that it seems that the city of New York has already made. And I'm not talking about you in the city. I guess the businesses of the city of New York have chosen that these 20 companies are going to be the ones that we're mostly going to lean on to do the work that we're asking. 80% of them? Yes. 80% of them. So I just want to make sure that when it comes to that conversation, that, that, that's something we talk about because uh, there, there's going to be a group of folks that are going to talk about choice. And it seems like they've already, within themselves, consolidated themselves to about uh, 20 companies that they think are doing, I guess, good work in the city of New York and should continue to get uh, their contracts and be clients of theirs. Um, so what about payment? Uh, do you, did you see in the study and the work that you've done uh, regarding what businesses pay, uh, there are companies that are concerned about their prices going up. Uh, and I think small businesses, mid-sized businesses, and large businesses all have different types of needs. But I think what I saw in the, in the study is that the smaller the business, the, the more they were paying for their trash. Um, is that a fair statement as well? And can you uh, elaborate on the, the findings in the study that speak to uh, <clears throat> how much businesses are paying? Right, so there is a citywide rate cap that the Business Integrity Commission sets. So it's illegal to go to charge above that rate cap on a per weight or per volume basis. Um, so okay. just to start, everyone's under the rate cap right. or should be under the rate cap. Um, beyond that, it's largely up to what a customer negotiates. Um, what we have seen today through interviews and through analysis of the data is there's very little logic to who pays what. Um, what we see is the ability to negotiate, the knowledge that you can negotiate, is really what determines your rate. So uh, this does bias uh, larger producers, or biases the system in favor of large producers. So if you have a big uh, portfolio of properties and a lot of waste, and this is a large uh, lucrative contract, uh, you can negotiate a better deal than, say, a corner bodega can. Right. So uh, in our initial study that led us to pursue the system, we found that small customers pay, I believe the number is 38% more than large customers. Okay, so smaller businesses are paying 38% more on average than the larger businesses. Of course, there's an economies of scale that we understand that the more trash you, got, you have, I guess the, the less you pay, but when it comes to tipping, uh, that doesn't change, right? Uh, wherever their the transfer station is, if it's, and I'm making this number up, $20 a ton, you tip it, that's how much you pay. Um, that's not gonna change in the back end. But in the front end, the trash does is valued at different rates. Is that also something? So when the customers are paying for the trash to be picked up, that varies significantly. But when you tip it, is the tipping fee generally the same across the board? A truck is a truck is a truck? Right, so when a, a truck is paying a transfer station to dump its contents, there's no distinction between this is bodega waste and this is an office building waste. Right. Like you said, trash is trash. Okay. For, um, for charges to customers, um, you know, what we found, th again, through data analysis and through interviews is this is largely a transparency issue. Uh, right. and the knowledge that you can negotiate is not always out there yeah. to smaller businesses. Mm -hmm. So that's very important. Just the business community, I really want to communicate that to, that there is a discrepancy there in how much carters are charging folks. It really has no sense. It's kind of like uh, who knows um, their rights to be able to negotiate and who doesn't and whether they can do that. I want to ask a question of Bic and you guys have, uh, let me know if I'm talking to the right agency here when I ask a question. Um, there was a Sanitation Salvage is a company that went out of business. Um, when they went out of business, uh, I believe that there was a process by which BIC and DSNY allowed for other carters to go about picking up that business. So they were told, look, this is a client list of the work that Sanitation Salvage used to do. You can go ahead and pick that trash up. Um, what was the success rate of the transfer of business between uh, several carters um, and, and sanitation salvage businesses. And I'm saying this, I guess, the question that I'm posing comes from foundationally that I heard from some of these larger companies that they actually couldn't take on the business at the price that sanitation salvage was charging. That sanitation salvage was charging prices that were so low that it, it didn't meet basic operational like uh, minimums for them to be able to make any profit off of it. 
Uh, and, and, the, and that goes to this race to the bottom situation where uh, you're trying to charge the least amount so you can get the most amount of businesses, but in doing so, you can't pay your workers a decent wage. You can't make investments into your, into your facilities, and you definitely can't make investments on your trucks. So I just want to know if that premise and that thought that I'm moving through has any foundation, I guess. So with sanitation salvage, you're exactly right. Um, what we found in, on the sanitation end, uh, working with BIC, I managed the day-to-day managing of which customers are switched and which uh, DSNY has to provide emergency service for. Um, anecdotally, from customers, other carters uh, across the board, uh, it's like you said, they were charging rates that no one else had in a decade. Uh, these were bottom of the barrel rates and through our investigations and the reason that they were denied, we know how they could do that. It's they were cheating their workers and they were running them 14 plus hour shifts and paying less than a minimum wage. Um, so in sanitation salvage, that's absolutely true. So when a small business who doesn't know the background of this, of what's happening with sanitation salvage, for example, they only know that there's a truck that comes and picks up my garbage and they do it in a very affordable rate. For a business, that's a good thing. They gotta make sure that they cut as many, you know, that they, their bottom line is in a way that they can make some money, they can pay their workers, and they continue to do work in the city of New York. We wanna make sure we support businesses and that they can continue to do this work. But what I, I guess what I want them to see is like pull the curtains back. That what they've done is that they've paid workers $80 to be in the back of a truck a night. Uh, and with hours that we've heard range from 12, 14, and 16 hour days. Um, so the, so uh, workers that are, drivers that are getting paid a low amount, uh, vehicles that are out of date, uh, recycling not being something that is encouraged or something they care about. So just loads of, of, of concerns that we have here in the city of things we want to address. We want to address the environment. We want worker safety. We want to make sure people are paid a, a, a fair wage or at least minimum wage, a legal wage, which also wasn't happening. But they're getting a good deal on their end. And I want to make sure that we put that in perspective, that there is a cost to you not paying of uh, a fair wage here in the, in, the, in the work that you do in getting your tr uh, trash hauled. It means that workers can die, like Mark Tordialo, who was one of the members that died, that was a, a worker for sanitation salvage, who was getting paid $80 a day. That's the type of stuff we're trying to address. Now, I wanna make sure that I, I put that in perspective as well, because uh, there are companies that are doing the right thing. There are companies that are paying their workers a fair wage. There are companies that are providing safety, that have newer trucks. Those companies are trying to compete with the sanitation salvages of the world that don't care about these workers, that don't care about these trucks. We're not trying to go after these carting companies that are doing the right thing. We want them to continue to do work in the city of New York. They are meeting a standard that we believe is a New York standard. But there are a lot of businesses that are not. And that is the ones, those are the ones that are gonna suffer through this system. There are a lot of conversations about, we don't wanna get rid of these carters, they're small businesses. But in this case, I wanna be very clear. If you're killing people, if you're not paying people a fair wage, if your trucks are destroying the environment, destroying, destroying our streets, I don't want you to do business in the city of New York. So I just wanna be clear, that's a statement from me that I wanna make sure it's clear. <laughs> um, so I got, I'm gonna ask one more question because I wanna allow for um, my colleagues to also ask questions and we've also been joined by Council, Council Member Constantinides and Mark Jonai. Um, so Los Angeles is a very popular uh, uh, comparison city that the folks that don't want this to happen always refer to. Uh, I've done my own research about what's happened in LA um, and I'm up to date with what's happening in LA. Uh, I believe the systems are different. I believe that the work that LA was doing was almost exclusively an environmental justice um, uh, push more so than uh, a, a a business, a business model and transaction push. They, could, they didn't care about the prices at the tail end. They, what they wanted was vehicles, miles, travels reduced, and they wanted to make sure that they were addressing an environmental issue. As a coastal city and a coastal uh, state, I understand why they care deeply about the environment and wanted to do that. But can you give us some contrast um, as to why this, uh, in the negative parts, or maybe there are places where they are actually the same in positive parts, but how does this differ to LA in any way? 
Um, so just stepping back before addressing Los Angeles, Los Angeles was not the first city to do this. This is a common policy, and there are many different ways of doing it all across the country. Do you know, can you name a couple of cities that have also done it that are not Los Angeles? So many small towns will have an exclusive contract or some sort of non-exclusive arrangement for municipal or residential pickup. So you know, a large company will just hold the contract and provide household collections. That's very common in a small town that doesn't have their own municipal workforce. Um, there are many cities, uh, larger cities, and this is mostly on the West Coast, but also um, you know, in the middle and on the East Coast, that uh, have a variety of different systems. So uh, it's a flexible policy that can be tailored to the specific policy needs and just the specific conditions of a city. Um, Los Angeles was an exclusive zone franchise. So they split the city into uh, 11 zones and one hauler uh, got the right to work in each zone. Um, there are other cities with non-exclusive systems uh, where uh, a handful or um, sometimes it's more like a uh, much more regulated permitting system where you're actually in contract with the city. Um, there's examples like San Jose, uh, where the process was used, used largely to build a, uh, an advanced um, disposal network. So it's, it varies. Los Angeles is one. Uh, it's definitely the most notable uh, in the news recently um, as, as we are doing this. But uh, a diff so a difference between their plan and our proposal, uh, the key issue is we are uh, proposing a non-exclusive plan. It's similar to how Los Angeles approached it with uh, incentivizing uh, environmental benefits, efficiency, um, and just protections for safety and workers. Um, ours allows, uh, our plan allows a baseline of three carters and the densest areas going up to five. Uh, and it addresses a lot of what I'm sure we'll hear about Los Angeles, uh, some of which is uh, mostly based on anecdotal evidence. Um, uh, so there was notably uh, a bumpy transition period when Los Angeles rolled out. There were many complaints about uh, missed pickups. Um, that is something we take very seriously and we think a non-exclusive system will directly address that in giving customers the right to say, oh, this Carter's not, not doing its job right away. Okay, I have a backup. Um, there were also, and this is much more anecdotal, uh, pricing complaints uh, saying, you know, my bill doubled, my bill tripled. Um, some of that might be that uh, you had a company that wasn't paying its taxes, which I know was the case in Los Angeles, or uh, you had a company that wasn't recycling, which was also the case, and now it has to recycle. Um, but we also think that we can increase the standards and give customers some choice on price as well. So if you get a quote and it's through the roof, uh, you have a backup and companies knowing that they have a backup will incentivize them to offer uh, very competitive rates. So I wanted to have a conversation about the exclusive or non-exclusive. I, I wanna say that this plan is a lot more than this conversation that we're about to have, and I'm glad that we were able to address other issues outside of that in a meaningful way, and I'm looking forward to hearing more testimony. Um, I wanna make a couple of arguments that I've heard uh, on, uh, on our front why exclusive zones makes sense. Um, and I've actually heard this from the carding companies themselves uh, uh, and how we can actually save money for businesses. So now I want to look out for the interests of businesses here and see how we can uh, do the most good with the least amount of harm, right? Which is how to achieve these goals of reducing vehicles miles, uh, making sure that workers are getting paid what they're supposed to get paid, and that the, sanita the sanitation salvages of the world don't, don't continue to do work in the city of New York, while also making sure that we um, don't hurt businesses in their in the, the bottom line. Um, a, a carding company told me that if they have a guaranteed amount of businesses, they could present the a lower bid to the Department of Sanitation through an RFP. If they know that they're gonna have 10,000 customers, for example, for 10 years guaranteed, and know exactly how the route is gonna be laid out even before they present you with the RFP, when they present you with the RFP, without having to uh, uh, find businesses that they can have a very efficient route with guaranteed businesses for 10 years that they can present a very, very low bid to the, the city of New York. If you insert several other people into, several other car carding companies into 
the, the bidding process. Um, they can't guarantee those 10,000 businesses. Now they're talking about fighting for those 10,000 businesses between two other carters. And they're saying that they're going to have to project, let's say, 20% of the businesses, that they can get 20% of those businesses. They're going to have to do it at the low end, depending on the comp how the competition works. In doing so, are going to have to present routes that are not as efficient and not, not, not as direct as they would have been if it would have been exclusively a one carter zone, and also um, not being able to guarantee the amount of businesses either. They don't know if they're going to be generating X amount of dollars versus Y amount of dollars because there's no guarantee on the businesses. So on that end, they feel like uh, with the route efficiency, which we save on petrolable, uh, uh, petrolable, I'm sorry, petroleum or gas, they'll save on gas through these efficiencies. They also said that the hours by which their workers would work would be reduced significantly through an, an, a more efficient route. So they're, so they're able to get um, their workers to work fair hours, uh, not less gas and guaranteed businesses allows them to come with a more competitive price. For businesses, I thought that this would be something that they would be interested in because it helps their bottom line. Um, how would a, a non-exclusive uh, non zone um, help achieve those goals at least when it comes to the pricing that we're charging uh, these businesses? Right, so there's a lot there. I can get to every point. Just remind me if, uh, if I haven't covered it. So yeah. just for what businesses actually want, we know that uh, any zone system, and we've looked at dozens of different models and the process that we went through and evaluating the benefits. Uh, the, the simple act of putting some boundaries around how a, how a route is run. Um, as you can see here, this is the before and after. The after is not the perfect computer generated uh, house to house route. Um, there's some inefficiency there, but you can see it's it's dramatically more efficient. So this is what a non-exclusive route would look like. Any any type of system we have is going to bring huge 50% and greater uh, traffic reductions and associated efficiency benefits with that. With that comes uh, lower operating costs, and this is what our draft environmental impact statement showed. Uh, even with additional program requirements, there will be lower operating costs. So the, uh, this policy change uh, will, not, uh, will not increase the bottom line for carters, and that should not be passed on to customers. And the way we ensure that is by making this a very competitive uh, solicitation process, making these zone contracts valuable. Um, your point was that an exclusive system would be more valuable to a carter. Um, I think there's a good point to that, but if you ask businesses what they want and what they think about that, you know, I've engaged hundreds of businesses, probably thousands with our representatives. Not a single one thinks that they will get better price with an exclusive system. Uh, they don't need 90 carters operating on their streets. Most businesses shop when they shop around, it's the three to five range. This replicates basic choice and just having a backup, having even the threat of firing your carter uh, handles most service complaints and it gets you a lower price. So if you ask businesses what would be better for you, and I think you'll hear it today, it's gonna be the non-exclusive system. Um, for carters, yeah, it would be great if carters had guaranteed business, but I think if they have guaranteed business and they don't have the threat of losing customers, then your service can go down. So we want them to have to work. We want them to have to offer uh, competitive prices. They're gonna have to offer competitive prices in their bid and a good service plan in their bid just to get a city contract. And then they're gonna have to compete with the customers. So we want the carters to work to get market share. We think that's a good thing and that's a good thing for customers. All right, I'm gonna have two more questions and I'm gonna pass it on to my colleagues for questions. Uh, the, the issue I have there in the conversation is once we go through the RFP, uh, do you have a projection if you want to make that statement publicly, of how many carters through a non-exclusive zone system would end up having contracts with the city of New York? And like, what's the number of carting companies that we would be left with? Um, sure. So we, we don't have a number, and I wanna make it clear, we don't think the number of companies is an inherently bad thing. The problems we're addressing is that we have 90 companies and they're all operating on top of each other and they're operating on the same streets. There's a way to organize this and allow smaller companies and a range of companies to survive in this. And that's what our plan sought to achieve. And we think 
uh, it's a fair playing field in our plan that a five truck operator can be very competitive and can have very efficient operations and can actually compete with the uh, multinational firms. Um, if this were an exclusive system, there are five companies that operate today that have the capital and have the customers to be competitive. So those small companies would be, they would not have a chance to compete. We want the best companies to get contracts, not, not just the biggest, it has to be the best. So I wanted to talk about the zones. So right now, you're operating under this understanding that there are 20 zones in the city of New York is what you cut them up to. I want to be clear, and a lot of people and some council members and some businesses uh, make the case that if you have 20 zones uh, and uh, one carter can have 15 of them uh, under an exclusive zone, uh, you know, you can have three carters run the whole city. Um, but the legislation doesn't preclude you from adding more zones. The legislation says at least 20. So I want to start by ha making clear with people that we're not asking for 20 zones necessarily. Uh, we want to, what we want to do is allow for the businesses to have the lowest amount of prices, right, in doing so, but also allow for there to be uh, an increase in the amount of zones that we can have so that one carter can't have, uh, you know, 75% of the businesses. Now, that would be impossible to do. You can expand off of the 20 zones. Your original study, for example, in Staten Island has three zones. That could easily, that three carters in one, in one entire zone. Um, that could be made into three zones, um, in Staten Island of individual carters in each. Um, so just speaking and having the conversation about that the zones are not necessarily set in stone and that we're not saying we want to do this under 20. So we're going to have folks under false premise and of course with misinformation try to stake the claim that three, or four, three to five carters could end up running the entire city. That is not our goal in any way, shape or form. That is not what we're trying to accomplish here. We do know that we can expand the number of zones we have and make them smaller and allow for more carters to do business in the city of New York. So I just want to make sure that we that that's clarified here, that the legislation specifically says 20 is at a minimum, uh, but it doesn't leave, uh, it doesn't cap the amount that we could expand it to, and that we're not looking to make the city of New York a five or even a 10 carter city. That we actually think that there is a lot more carters than that that do good work here. But I do want to say, a reduction in the amount of carters that are doing business in the city of New York is a goal that I have, that I think is important, because um, this customer satisfaction that businesses are talking about and service. If you win an RFP, you're one of the top companies in the city of New York. You're not talking about a B-level company. You're talking about A-level companies winning an RFP that's extremely competitive and rigorous. Off the bat, you're getting a good company. So I just want to be, and I want to be clear, I trust that those companies that get these contracts at the top are elite companies that understand service and understand making sure that their customers are taken care of. So I want to be clear, the RFP process right off the bat ensures that you're going to get a high quality Carter. Poss possibly, if you're within the 20% of the city that's not using one of the top 20 companies, an increase in service and in product and in how people do their work. So I just want to be clear that this idea that you won't get good service, you're already getting one of the top tw uh, top at least 20 companies in the city of New York doing work in your district or in your zone, which is a vast improvement from this fight of, now can we go to the slide of the, the, the 25 carters in one block? This one on uh, West 57th Street. 25 carters on one block. I, out of those 25 carters, and I'm gonna throw up a fake number and just make it up, five, let's say five carters are bad carters. Those five businesses are already going to get an improvement right off the bat in the RFP system. So I just want to say that the RFP itself is supposed to provide good players. So I just want to just clarify those points. Um, and, and then for, for BIC, uh, the city of New York does business with very, what I call shady companies. Sanitation Salvage did business with the city of New York. Five Star did business with the city of New York. Flag did business with the city of New York. The city of New York has no, seems to have no problem doing business with carding companies that, seem, that have very s negative track records. So my concern actually comes from, are we going to get rid of the bad guys in this system when BIC itself allows for the city to do work with carding companies that are very suspect? So BIC doesn't directly uh, hire carding companies for the city. BIC vets 
the carding companies, and we were constantly looking at their good character, honesty, and integrity. As you saw two weeks ago, um, we denied the renewal application of Flag and Formica Container, uh, and as of yesterday, they're out of the industry. So um, where we see those issues, we take action. So who evaluates whether a carding company deserves to do business with the city? Because it seems like every time BIC finishes an investigation and finds out that they're bad, DSNY has to scramble to move a contract over to a more reputable, I guess, company. Um, but why is it that the city of New York doesn't have a system in place to track who's good and who's bad and whether or not this RFP system is gonna, would help us through that? That's for DSNY. So it's just, uh, you, you, your evaluation system right now, I guess is what I'm saying, is suspect. What makes me feel comfortable that an RFP system would allow for us to ensure that the flags, the sanitation salvages, and the five stars of the world are not the ones receiving contracts? Yeah, so the commercial waste zone system will solve any problem that exists. Uh, the RFP process will be exhaustive. We will look not just at price, but health and safety plans, uh, the prior work records, employee prior record uh, in safety, dealing with employees, fair wages. Um, it'll be a solid waste management plan. It'll be an exhaustive review, and through this you know, very detailed process, we'll be able to select the best carters to collect waste. And you can't do, and you can't do that now. Well, we don't. Well, yeah, right now the Department of Sanitation doesn't regulate uh, commercial card. Okay, so an RFP system is supposed to be the system that'll allow you to now be able to track who's good and who's. Yes, good. and there'll be contractual remedies so that if a carter isn't complying with the contract that it enters into the city, uh, we can take immediate action, cl including an up to termination. Okay, thank you. And now I'm going to allow for my colleagues to ask questions. I'm going to put three minutes on the clock, uh, and we're going to start with Councilmember Constantinidis, followed by Councilmember Jonan. Thank you, Chair Reynoso. Um, I have three questions, so I'm going to ask the questions first, and then you can take the time to answer them. Um, number one, uh, how does the commercial waste zone bill help us meet the administration's goal of zero waste by 2030 and our overall goal of reducing emissions 80% by 2050. Uh, second, uh, what role does recycling and composting have to have in lowering greenhouse gas emissions? And three, uh, how will commercial waste zones create jobs and recycling uh, in the city of New York? So starting with emissions, um, the big obvious benefit here is we're reducing truck traffic by 50% or more. So having trucks drive less is 18 million miles taken off the road every year. Uh, there's a 50% uh, reduction in truck traffic and similar reductions in greenhouse gas emissions and uh, particulate matter associated uh, with, um, with truck operations. Uh, in terms of recycling, uh, that is a great benefit of this plan that we have not really spent much time on yet, so um, thank you for asking the question. Um, what, what we are seeking to do is get uh, companies that are committed to furthering our zero waste goals. Uh, we'll do that first in the uh, RFPs for the zones. Every carter is going to have to submit their zero waste plan, and that's a criteria that we'll use to select companies that are willing to make investments and are willing to demonstrate they can handle materials properly. They're actually gonna send their recyclables to the correct place. They're making investments uh, in composting and organics processing, or they're partnering with people that can do that. Um, furthermore, everyone that gets a contract is going to have to offer these services. A lot of why we don't have uh, really robust recycling participation now across the board is companies don't have to offer it. Businesses have to get a carter, they're required to recycle, but it's kind of a loophole that uh, just has blame being passed between the carter and customer. This will say if you are a zoned carter, you have to give the service for everything that that customer is required to do. So you will get a recycling truck. If you are required to separate your organics, you will get an organics truck. Uh, and we will incentivize uh, voluntary organics above and beyond minimum requirements. Um, furthermore, we will have those services offered at a discount. So customers will be incentivized in their bills uh, to separate their materials properly uh, and they will have a lower bill because of it. Similar to- Let me quickly just jump sure. in because I'm, I'm also out of, almost out of time okay. here. So I'm also gonna show, what is our plan on the long-term 
relating to trucks. Uh, what environmental standards are we going to be holding the actual trucks to in the long term that we feel as, we, as new technology moves forward, as we're able to reduce emissions from the trucks themselves, going above and beyond where we've gone now, how are we going to be able to continue to move the industry to a you know, completely you know, emissions-free over time? And that's another area where we can use the RFP process to incentivize commitments above and beyond the minimum requirements. The minimum requirements being Local Law 145, uh, which is coming into place. So at a minimum, to be considered, you have to be in full compliance uh, with that emissions law. But we want above and beyond. So we want commitments for making investments in natural gas or electric trucks. Um, those are the kind of things that we want to see, and you will have a better chance of winning a contract if you can make those commitments. I look forward to working with you to ensure that happens and working with our chair and ensuring you know, I, I'm, I'm a supporter of this bill because of the environmental concerns, because I know it's going to make our streets safer, because we're going to make our workers safer and give them a, a better future. So with that, I, I thank the chair for his indulgence of me going over time. <laughs> thank you, Councilmember Costantinides. Uh, we've been joined by Councilmember Cornegie and I uh, want to go ahead and Councilmember Joe and I for questions. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I uh, am the chair of small business, and with that comes a great responsibility to assure that our small businesses continue to operate in an environment which will allow them to survive and thrive. Competition, open markets, is the only way I know to assure increase in quality of service and a decrease in prices for the products and the services that they purchase. My concerns are if we limit zoning to one or three vendors, there is no assurance that we'll have price fixing or go back to the bad old days of Louis walking into your place of establishment with a cigar and giving you an ultimatum. That's the reason BIC was formed, to fight corruption, to fight price fixing, to weed out any illegal or unlawful element in the industry. This will take us back 23 years ago. I want to see the same arguments being made to our independent operators of taxis that say there are too many of you out there, we're going to determine who survives and who doesn't. I want to see these same arguments hold water with a nail salon that says you have too many nail salons in New York City, or food establishments. New Yorkers have enjoyed the freedom and privileges of choice. That's who we are. That's who guarantees our freedom and sets us apart from the rest of the world. The arguments made of environmental concern and impact, explain to me where these operators are coming from. Where are their trucks departing their station? Where is their transfer station where they're going to be dumping their products and going back to service the corridors? The same amount of traffic, because it could be a Queens operator that have a Bronx uh, zone will have to cross that bridge to get to their customers to go back to their transfer station to come back again. So there will be an increase in traffic. And I don't underestimate the, in the innovation and creativity of our small businesses. Operators know how to cut corners. They're not going to put out a truck to go pick up a single customer miles away. It wouldn't make sense for them. No, would it make sense from an economic of fuel or labor costs or wear and tear on their trucks? If we implement this in its current form with limited options, we've undermined every commercial corridor and operator out there. We've put another burden on them, and this is government again saying, we know what's best for you while we chisel away at the bottom line of every mom and pop shop out there. Last night at 9.30, I was summoned to Morris Park Avenue by a restaurant owner who just received a $500 increase in the fees that they're paying their carter. That is a 200% increase from what they were paying previously. These hearings are important. 
because we get to understand all sides and hopefully that'll help us make a much better decision. So I'm relying on you, Chair, and my colleagues to do right. But if you can answer those questions about what assurance this is going to have on the environment based on limited supply, what assurances are we going to have that prices and services, prices won't go through the roof and the decrease in service, I'd like to hear from all of you. Thank you. Hey, and just so for the clapping, if you do this, visually, we'll all see that you're supportive when you do this, um, and it won't disrupt the hearing. So let's not clap. If you have something that you want, that you appreciate, wave your hands. If you don't appreciate, just don't wave your hands. Thank you. So there were many parts to your, your question and statement there. Uh, to begin with, we did an exhaustive environmental analysis to determine the environmental savings. We got the actual routes from the Carters, and we then modeled what the system would look like under a zone system. We even took into account the exact time that the customers get picked up. So if a customer gets picked up at 11 p.m., we assume the customer would be picked up at the same time. And using this analysis, we found that there would be 50% savings in vehicle miles traveled, 18 million miles total. Can you go to the, can you go to the, the example of what we do now versus what exactly? Thank you, that's important. He also had a question about the environmental impact. Well, that's that. the environmental impact. So right. you t are you saying that a Bronx Carter Operating in the Bronx will have to re be from the borough of the Bronx with a transfer station from the borough of the Bronx? Is that what you're saying? So what we're saying is that any Carter can compete for any zone. Uh, we will look at the transfer station that the, the Carter is tipping at. I mean, you, you had stated that a Bronx transfer, a, a Bronx Carter might tip in the Bronx, but we will give weight if a, to proximity of pickup. So if a Carter is picking up in the Bronx, we would like to see a disposal in the Bronx. If a Carter is picking up in Queens, we'd like to see disposal in Queens. So that, that will be weighted. Uh, so we do not expect at all to have the, and in fact it will eliminate the issue that you're you're, you've just mentioned. And then on pricing, you, you stated that um, some, uh, uh, someone in your district, I assume, uh, got a $500 bill higher. This plan will eliminate that possibility. There'll be a maximum price set, and they will be obligated by contract not to charge more than that. And the customer will have the ability to negotiate lower pricing. So you would not be able to all of a sudden increase pricing by $500. That would be prohibited. And here, the Department of Sanitation will be monitoring these contracts. We will have outreach staff. We will, we will require the carters to educate their customers uh, so that they are aware of rights. And I, I, my impression is now that a lot of small businesses are not aware of their rights and are not able to negotiate with carters. That would change under the zone system. That's not true. I'm a, I'm a small business owner. I negotiated with my carter. I negotiate on price and service. And it sounds to me that government knows best again approach doesn't work here. I'm gonna ask a question on the record and I hope that, Chairman, please, I'm yeah. so sorry. Gonna, and after this, I'm done. The question, but after that, I can cut you off. Have you already determined the winners without the RFP going out? Because this all sounds like you've set up an environment to determine who is going to be selected and which companies are going to prevail and which companies are we going to destroy? Absolutely not. The whole point of this is to create a competitive process that furthers goals for the customers that allows competition and price uh, assurances uh, favors low pricing and transparent pricing, but also works for public safety, for worker safety, and for the environment. So we have not determined who the companies are. Uh, one of the driving forces behind our non-exclusive system is that it's fair for the carters that exist today. If you can be the most competitive carter, you're gonna get a contract. If you can offer the best service at the best price uh, with the least environmental footprint, you're gonna get a contract. And look, uh, thank you. You, you mentioned can, the, the yeah, Bronx. The, what is I, this, the map of, that we are seeing here? Uh, we know the environmental benefits, and th this is a map of everyone going through Bronx Community District 2, picking up one stop, and how long their routes are going through it. We know this is the case because the Carters gave us this information. They gave us their routes. When we did the first analysis, they said, oh, we gave you the wrong data, so we asked for it again, and it was the exact same thing. We know this is the case. They've reported it time and time again. 
And it's not their fault. It's because there are 90 companies operating on top of each other. To fill a truck, you have to, you have to run all throughout the city. That's, that's the, you're, it's impossible to have efficiencies now, and we're allowing that while still allowing for customer choice and price assurances. So, so I wanted to follow up because a lot of these uh, folks believe that the, the market provides the most efficiencies. And we talked about how the market is the one that's driving like, the race to the bottom. But environmental impacts on truck traffic. In this one, it shows uh, through this community board, runs all these trucks run through it, and they're picking up from Westchester and what I think is Sunset Park, the end of Sunset Park or Bay Ridge, and that all these trucks are moving through all these communities, and they're all coming out of that one little, uh, what you painted, that you guys call it a bl the black, which is, is probably a black and brown community, I'm pretty sure, but uh, that you have pointed there, all those trucks and all those routes run through that, and that people think this is efficient, and that the system works, is beyond me. But um, I appreciate uh, your answers to that question. We wanna call on Council Member Cornegie, and he's gonna be followed by Council Member Deutsch. Uh, and thank Councilman you, Chair. Malone is back, um, and he wanted to ask questions, so it's going to be Carnegie, uh, Councilman Malone, and then Councilman Bedoy. So I have more of a statement than a question. As the former chair of the Committee on Small Business, um, I'm acutely aware that um, the council, in its zest and zeal, has begun to shrunk, shrink several industries. I believe that um, the inability to allow business or the market to regulate business is a fundamental overreach in, on, in government's perspective, from my perspective that government is doing. I believe that all of the things that you're mentioning can be attained in, 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 even in terms of decreasing the environmental impact by not, you know, you don't have to shrink the industry in order to do that. There's, there's ways to do this. Um, I have a Bill 996 that seeks to do the exact same thing, but, has an, but doesn't shrink the industry, or at least allows businesses to be able to negotiate their contracts, creates a business environment that's conducive to growth and development in business, but still has an environmental, you know, regulates the environmental impact by giving BIC the ability to do its job or what it was formulated to do. I, I don't understand when we look at other places, like California, for example, which actually had to offer an apology based on the escalated amounts uh, of fines and fee of fees that went into, into business. I, I don't understand why we would go down a pathway that's already proven uh, to be counterproductive to business. Well, that's one of the reasons that we um, favor the non-exclusive system. Customers will have choice. Uh, we did an analysis that carding costs um, will be $14 million lower under a zone system. Uh, we, we, you know, this is based on actual data that we received from the carters. We took into account the fact that routes would be much more efficient, and even adding on to the fact that there'll be additional recycling collection, organics collection, they'll have to have a customer service hotline. Uh, the carding cost will still be $14 million less. So we don't have any expectation that pricing will be higher. And by having competition, uh, at least three carters in each zone, we fully expect that pricing will be equally as competitive, competitive as it is now, and you'll get much better service. And if there's a problem, you, be, you can contact the city who can directly address the issue if you're not getting it done with the carter. What, what's the difference between the zone carting plan in California and what your analysis is? Is there a stark difference? With DSNY's plan, yes, the Los Angeles system that you're referring to allows one carter in each zone. Our plan allows three to five carters per zone. Uh, that was largely driven through two years of engagement that we did with the business community, as well as considering impacts to the broader carding community and to the city's management. So there are a lot of different systems. It's not just LA that does uh, policies like this. We looked at what's been done across the board and what are the unique circumstances for New York to develop a New York specific plan. So are you offering a guarantee to businesses that if there is an increase that there'll be subsidies, that there'll be, because I can't imagine that if you go from the ability to negotiate contracts with any carter that you'd like to, to three, to, to one to three, that there wouldn't be an increase. You're gonna set the price ceiling, correct? 
there will be a rate cap and that will be the maximum rate that a carter offers to charge will be a driving factor in whether or not they get a contract. So they will get points for their commitment for offering the lowest price. Beyond that, they will still have to shop around for market share. So Carter's gonna have to be competing twice on pricing and customer service if they wanna survive. And that will lead to low prices and good customer service. So do, do you not agree that competition is the driver of business and um, uh, consumer, customers benefit from the ability to pit uh, different companies against each other? So our plan acknowledges that and acknowledges that customer choice can lead to good customer service and good pricing. But our plan also acknowledges that the current system with 90 carters operating citywide leads to inefficiencies that hurt the environment, public safety, and make it impossible to operate a carting company efficiently. And I just so wh what, ab what about workers and shrinking the industry will actually eliminate jobs? And some of those jobs are for second chance workers, people who have ha found an opportunity to after having trying circumstances and challenging circumstances have found good gainful employment in this industry. And you're, if you go from 90 to three, you can't tell me that the industry won't shrink and that jobs will not be dissolved. So I'm, I'm gonna, and after you answer this question, I'm just gonna have to limit your okay. questioning, council member. So thank you for that question. Um, Sanitation studied the socioeconomic impacts of a commercial waste zone plan on the industry, and one of the things we looked at was the impact on jobs. Um, and the numbers that we found actually look quite good. Um, the vast majority of workers will still have jobs, and there will be minimal job losses. Um, additionally, because of investments in recycling and what we anticipate to be increased recycling um, and diversion rates, uh, we project additional job growth um, at recycling facilities in the city. That said, this is an issue that the administration takes very seriously, and sanitation will be proactive in addressing um, the situation of workers who find themselves potentially in this position. We will maintain, we will actively maintain a displaced workers list that allows workers to connect with jobs in the industry. Um, we will also put obligations on carters um, to take action in this in this area, uh, we anticipate riders in the agreements with the carters that selected that get selected um, to utilize programs um, to promote like local, local hiring, such as Hire NYC. Uh, I just want to thank the, the chair for indulging me. If there's a second round, I have more questions. Yeah, and I, I did want to just make a point um, that <clears throat> government has gotten involved in the business environment um, in the past. They did it when Wall Street got out of hand. It added an eight-hour workday. It added a minimum wage. Is places where government thought it should involve itself when it thought that businesses were acting egregiously. Um, and that's what I think we're intending to do here. While I agree that a, a market that is open is something that we want to promote when it's working. In this case, you know, we don't want any, no, any more vigils for the Mark Tur Diallos of the world. And like, that's what we're trying to reform here. And I just want to make sure that I note that. Uh, Councilmember Chaim Deutsch. And there will be a second round, by the way. Oh, I'm sorry, Councilmember Vallone and then Councilmember Deutsch. Councilmember Vallone. Thank you, Chair. There's a lot going on, and there's a lot of questions from the council members, and you see there's Is your mic on, Councilmember Vallone? It's on. It's All right, on. sorry. Uh, after our fireworks event last night and having a good time, we're, we're trying to get through today. The concerns have not gone away. The benefits are clear. We're trying to do environmental, we're trying to minimize impact to communities. Mine, which is always forgotten in this conversation, which gets my district very upset with waste transfer stations and continuous commercial truck traffic through residential neighborhoods is a pillage on any neighborhood, not just the ones that we tend to focus on. So minimizing that impact to the communities is a positive in the conversation Upgrading the industry is a positive in the conversation. Safety standards across the board is a positive. Newer trucks and better environmental footprints, always a positive. The other side it gets lost against the positive, which is the hardworking local companies that have been doing this, whether they're family owned or generational owned, um, the businesses themselves, I have a very diverse district from Korean, Chinese, Italian, Greek, you name it, 
they're there. The language barriers, if they're going to be dependent on negotiating a contract with one to three carters without language interpretation, translation, and your exact testimony was you're expecting carters to explain that to them. That's not going to happen. I want to hear how, what was the determination of what small businesses are being charged now versus what you feel will be charged after this? So we looked at operating costs to the industry as a whole rather than predicting how the bidding process and then customer negotiation within the zone would happen. We can't predict that, but we know that operating costs to the industry will decrease. So there's no reason that this plan will make Carter's charge more to, to make their bottom well, line. You just and said two things. One, you can't determine the first part of it. And two, because the operating costs are going to go down, that there should be savings. That's not any guarantees for, the, for the, those who are making the contracts of there's no way to determine, one, and two, because there's going to be savings, you think they're going to be passed on to the businesses. I, so I, the, way that, the way that we encourage it to be passed on is we, use, we make these uh, RFPs and these zones very competitive. Uh, we have pricing, low pricing, as the highest criteria in scoring. So if you want a contract, you have to offer a low maximum price. That is a contractual guarantee that you will not charge a single customer, even the most difficult customer in a zone from a Carter's perspective, beyond this rate. Beyond that, if and, they, and if once they you want make market that, share. Once you make that determination of what that contract's going to be, how can we determine from what their current contract is today versus what that new contract is going to be, the difference in that gap? Is there a limitation as to what that will be? Not the cap on the max, but if I'm paying $100 today and under the new system I'm going to pay $250 tomorrow, and that's okay because it's under the cap, you're going to wipe out small business. I, I, I don't have the conversation of small business do not have an overhead to pay another dollar, period. They don't. So as we've discussed earlier in this testimony, uh, small businesses often pay a higher rate than larger businesses. They're the ones that don't have the transparency. Um, our program, beyond having uh, competitive pricing in the bidding and having shopping around uh, to get market share, um, DSNY is committed to broad outreach in encouraging uh, during the transition, customers to shop around, get a competitive price, and we're going to have yeah, uh, Carter. Chair, on that last note, but you're, you're encouraging to shop around when we're limiting their choices from one to three. So there's, there are still numerous concerns. You can be frustrated all you want. We're more frustrated. You're talking about impacting the entire city and communities like mine that are, are, are just pillaged with trucks coming through it, and it's the number one call on the quality of life impact and I don't hear how that's going to be solved, and I also don't hear how my small business is going to be protected, and how we're going to bring those companies that want to achieve this now, that are set by a standard that is done well by the middle and the larger companies, that want to make that new change to get to the RFP on what we're going to do to help those, not the ones that BIC has got concerns with, we agree, we need to make those changes, but the ones that are going to try to get to the next level to meet these RFP requirements, what we're going to do to get them there, bring them to the safety standards, bring them to a new job workforce place that's safe, that can follow the leaders of some of the, the groups that are already here. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, I'm sorry, just I wanted to clarify. I wanted to, uh, you're saying, so can we get back to the one where all the 25 cars on six blocks and, and can map? Because we respond to his last. Yeah, because Council of Valone's district is also one of those districts that are. So are impacted by truck traffic, and can you explain how that that reduction? I think is that what you're asking? Like, how how are we guaranteeing that reduction? And Councilor Valone, this is a five different snapshots of maps of the amount of carters that run through six blocks in one district. I think it's less like eight blocks in another, and it just shows the amount of carter the trucks that go through those, the uh, not the trucks, the carting companies that go through those. Areas. This so we, is we have 11 unique... customers on 24th Street in Brooklyn have nine different carters. So, so, Mr. Chair, we have a unique situation in College Point. So, where you have the waste transfer stations and the loading zones. So, you have the traffic coming through there to make their drop offs. 
and we're still determining whether the new routes are now going to increase the capacity at those waste transfer stations or how those routes are going to be determined. So we're still concerned about so that. So I, I want to make it clear that yeah. a hallmark of our plan is truck traffic reduction, and this is citywide. Every neighborhood in every borough of the city will see a reduction in truck traffic. This is not one neighborhood benefiting at the expense of the other. Your neighborhood, your district will see a reduction in truck traffic. But he, I think what he's talking about is he has waste transfer stations. So and what, what, in our EIS, what? we looked at three cases studies. One of those case studies was College Point, and it had the transfer station in there. It sees a reduction in truck traffic. And can you give that to Council Member Valone, that information, for after the hearing? Yeah, not, not offhand, but yes, I can follow up with that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Hein uh, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Our EIS uh, showed that the vehicle miles traveled reduction in College Point would actually be 60 percent, so it's slightly higher than the city average. And also, you, you, I just wanted to emphasize the safety. You, you, you mentioned safety, and that's something that we take very seriously. That's one of the main goals of this bill. We know there are unsafe practices now. Uh, this bill would help ensure the safety of the drivers and the public. There would be 18 million miles saved, so you're going to have fewer crashes. Uh, we will be able to enforce, through contractual remedies, uh, labor issues or uh, wage issues. And so, uh, but we, we can but we can raise the safety standards without creating zones. So I mean, they're two different things. We can always raise the standards of any industry, but we don't need to change. Well, well to but do that. here we're going to have a direct contract with the Carters, so we'll be able to manage that very directly uh, and better able to assess that. We we Thank also you know during our very extensive public outreach program um, heard directly from workers and their representatives who came to our hearings. Um, and our events to speak up um, and shed some light on what's going on now currently in the industry. Um, and what we learned, um, if you go back to one of the, the a typical route, um, what that means from a worker standpoint is a worker might be expected to, to um, be on a route that traverses 100 miles through multiple boroughs on a 14-hour shift. Um, what we heard um, in our public engagement process and what we, what we learned from studying the industry is that companies are cutting corners at the expense of workers. Um, and so by making the system more efficient and having shorter, more efficient routes, uh, there that, that, And that's how I started my test. That's without question. I, I, we didn't, no one's questioning that that needs to be better and those stand, immediate, we're all on board with that. No one's questioning any of that. It's, it's the other side of that impact that the chair is trying to flush out and we're trying to get the, the safety standards and the proper future of the condition of the trucks, the workers' rights, getting companies to follow the lead of proper organizations and companies that have been doing it already to give that a footprint, are all laudable, and then we thank the chair for having that conversation to get that done, finally. It's the other part of the conversation that you're hearing the council members of the impact on the small businesses, the neighborhoods, f free market, and government's place in all of that is still what we question. And then, so, because we want to move on to Council Member Deutsch, I just want to say um, this is the first time I've heard that there should be that the, this could we should actually be saving money. The Carter should be saving money through this process. So this is the first time I'm hearing that. I've never made a commitment to council members or to anyone in the public in stating that this would save money. Um, I actually um, actually think there's a price to pay for the environment, and I'm okay with that. Uh, we have did that with a buildings bill where we just said 25% of the worst actors in the city of New York are going to get uh, fined if they don't bring their buildings um, to a smaller carbon footprint. So I understand the value in making sure that we take care of our environment. But you're saying that the operating costs should decrease. And I wanted to ask very intently, um, would you accept an RFP that doesn't speak to, that, to, to your understanding about those reductions? that you wholeheartedly believe and have data and information that says your operating costs should decrease, why would you come in with an RFP that is more expensive than the work that's currently being done? Can we, can we speak to that? Yes, well under the RFP process, pricing will be the largest factor that's considered in determining which contractor, which carters get the zone. So if a carter comes in with an extremely high price, uh, there, it is highly, highly unlikely that that carter would be selected to uh, perform work in any specific zone. Uh, there are other factors involved, but we understand pricing is critical. 
Uh, that's why we did the socioeconomic analysis to, to evaluate uh, what the overall carding cost would be after the zone program is included. And we are very uh, understanding that small businesses don't want to see huge increases in prices, even if the program is safer and it's better for everybody in New York City. Uh, mm -hmm. So pricing will be the largest factor that is considered. And but this uh, is but this is big for me because I'm the one pushing this and I care about this intently to pitch this to other council members. Operating costs by the carters should decrease. That's correct, and that's in the the, the draft environmental impact statement. So the so. environmental impact statement says that operating costs should decrease. That's Can correct. I safely then make a statement and say that because of that? operating costs decreasing, that prices should, for the most part, stay the same or decrease. Think, yeah, I, th I think I'll give you time to, to, to answer that because that, be that would be something that the businesses here would really appreciate. So doing the RFP process right, that's what we should get to. There are gonna be some instances where you have carters cutting corners currently, and we talked about sanitation salvage and what we saw from their pricing. If you have a low bill and it's because carters aren't doing any recycling or because they're not paying their workers properly, we can't guarantee that your bills won't go up. So if you're not a good actor now and that's how you can offer low pricing, the customers might have uh, increased price, but you know that happened when Sanitation Salvage had their uh, license denied. Uh, I'm hearing that might be happening with FLAG currently. So it's, that's why we can't guarantee it, but if we do everything properly with the RFP process, there's no reason prices should go up across the board. We are holding them to competitive prices, and they should be able to be at current prices or lower. All right, so this is important, especially for uh, Councilmember McCorney and Councilmember Jonah, Jonah, who really deeply are concerned about the businesses, increasing cost of businesses, that you're saying outside of the sanitation salvages of the world, who did everything possible, like cut every corner, paying $80 for 14 hours of work for their helpers, uh, had the oldest trucks, were not even paying uh, minimum wage to a lot of these folks, uh, issues with uh, safety and across the board. Those guys were charging the least amount because they, did, they cut every corner that was ima imaginable. We don't want those people doing business in the city, but if operating costs for carters across the board should be reduced, you're not expecting uh, a significant increase or an increase at all um, on average across the board in the city of New York. That would, that would be, that's one of the, the strongest talking points that exists in the city council right now is we want to limit the cost of businesses. And what you're saying, for the first time I'm hearing, even though it's been in the report, is that there is a reduction in operating costs for carters. Okay, so I just wanted to make that statement. That's, thank you very much for that. Just another, another, another bullet in the belt, I guess, is what you want to call it for when I have to advocate for this. Uh, Councilmember Heimdeutsch. Yeah, thank you, Sorry Chair. Sorry for making a reference uh, using guns. I shouldn't have done that, so I apologize. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I just want to mention that I am an extremely strong supporter of sanitation and uh, the work that the men and women of the sanitation department do. But I have uh, many concerns uh, with this bill, and I can I not possibly get it into three minutes. Um, I did speak to the chair, and I, I met yesterday with one of my uh, business improvement districts in my district, and I surely hope that we're going to have a lot more conversations about this before this bill goes into effect, because otherwise you're going to hear members speak out about this. Um, now, how confident are you that if this bill should pass, that this plan would work? So I, I want to make a distinction between our plan and this bill. Um, they're not the exact same thing, but talk, we're just going to talk about our plan. We are confident that our plan will work. This has been four years of planning. It has been years of stakeholder engagement, hundreds of meetings with hundreds of stakeholders, including opponents, supporters, people, we're doing, people that think we're doing too much, people that think we're not doing enough customers of all types, property owners, down to small businesses and business improvement districts. So we have heard those concerns and we've created a plan that will get all of the benefits we want to see to the public while working for carters and working for customers. Okay, you did mention that uh, there's going to be job loss. Um, and um, so what are your plan in regards, in regards to job loss and what is your plan 
in response to small business owners, uh, not only employees, but those small business owners that worked very hard or had a business for the last 20, 30, 40, or 50 years, and you may put them out of business. So on, on the last point, we have created a plan that does not bias the selection process for small local companies. If you are a good small local company, in our plan you have uh, just as much chance uh, of getting a zone if you put a competitive bid forward than a multinational company. Um, so this is a fair playing field for local industry. You have to, you have to commit to high standards, that's what we want. So if you have 800 carding, uh, private carding companies now, and let's say many of them, if let's say you get more than half that commit to high standards and go with the bids, uh, and they put in the competitive price and everything looks okay, are they guaranteed to get one of those zones? So we will be releasing the RFP, and that will state publicly and for everyone that wants to uh, submit a proposal, this is how we're gonna score um, this is the process to determine who is best fit. So whoever's not, whoever's, so wh whoever reaches that standard, it's who is best fit. It's hitting standards and committing to good service and good pricing. That's who will win the zone. So if you have 400 of those private co uh, carding companies that D meet those quick standards. Quick correction, it's, it's 90 companies that exist now. Okay, that, so if you, ha if you have the majority of that that meet those standards, um, I'm sorry, I said 800. Uh, I thought it was 80. Uh, if you have a majority of those companies that meet that standard, is it possible that some of those companies will not um, get that RFP? Yeah, the, any company that submits a proposal that's not as good as the top three to five won't be winning a contract for that zone. That does not necessarily mean they're out of business. This is regulating one part of the waste industry. Um, there are many other streams like construction and demolition, uh, other types of hauling that companies today doing the type of collections that we're regulating currently also have business doing those operations. That won't change. Um, we have uh, allowances for subcontracting when it works for our program goals. So if you're a subcontractor to pick up recycling and you're meeting the high standards of the prime contract holder, um, that's okay. And that is an opportunity. So we've designed this plan uh, to give many opportunities to all companies that can meet our high standards. Now with this so be- I'm gonna ask for Council Member Doris to ask one more question and that way he gets to answer that. Then Council Member Jonah is gonna ask one more question and you answer that. We have 13 panels, all 13 right. panels, and we're supposed to finish by one o'clock. That is, that is as hard as doing a 1,000 person, uh, 1,000 company route. It's impossible. So, so we're gonna, we're gonna ask the council members to wrap up and then we're gonna move through two minute testimonies um, and allow everyone to speak. Your input and your statements are more important than the back and forth. So we're gonna allow you to speak and keep it moving, all right? So uh, council member Deutsch, your last question, followed by council member Jonai. So um, if, uh, if, you would, if you should, if sanitation should implement uh, their plan, how would you implement it throughout the city, the five boroughs? Uh, so after a law passed enabling us to do this plan, we would put out an RFP for all 20 zones. So you do all 20 zones, which would cover the entire city? That's right. When, uh, when you implement- Thank you, Council Member Deutsch. No, I'm I so sorry, Council Member Deutsch. I, I asked one question. I asked you to do one question. Yeah, we I understand have, uh, that. We have, yeah, limited we have limited time and we're trying to give everybody a lot yeah, of- I just, I just, strike. let me just finish my I'm gonna ask this. one more question. I'm gonna ask Jonai to go and then you're gonna have this second round and you ask one more question. So Council Member Jonai first, then I'm gonna come back to you to ask one more question. But we really have to limit the time so that allow for everyone in this room to speak. So Council Member Jonai. Thank you, Chair. I just want to reiterate the arguments that are made on the reduction of operating costs. And let's apply that to, let's say, the pharmaceutical business, where we have Walgreens, CVS, and Dwayne Reed that control the, f the majority of the pharmacies in this city. Our prices of medication still continue to go up, and they control the market share. So although their operating costs have gone down, prices have still gone up. But I want to get to the real issues here. If we truly want to address the environmental impact, we want to talk about worker safety, we want to talk about proper employee compensation, efficiency, servicing, and pricing to the small businesses, recycling compliance, and the best fit scenario, 
why don't we get rid of the commercial carting industry altogether? And let's give it to the Department of Sanitation. There'll be no additional charges on our small businesses, and according to the standard, we won't have an issue. But there'll be no appetite for that, because nobody wants that, right? Councilman Jordan, can you which will, ask I'm making, I got my ask minute, the right? No, no, which I makes, ask a minute. I said one which, question. Which leads me to my, my point. This has all been set up to determine who is going to be the carding industries that are going to service New York City. Because if there was a true appetite, we would be coming up with more creative ways to address all of those issues. But that is not the issue. That is the, the fog that we've created in making sure that we get rid of commercial carding companies that have been operating for generations and years. And where government is going to put their finger on a scale to determine who is going to prevail and survive and let everyone else fall by the wayside. That's the real issue, and I'm glad I said it on record. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Jornai. Please remember the, the waves. Council Member, so now we've been joined by two Council Members. Um, we're supposed to finish in an hour, and we have 13 panels. I'm going to keep saying that to, to encourage Council Members to cut it short. But we have Council Member uh, Deutsch, followed by Council Member Powers. Are you going to ask questions, Council Member Powers? And, and, all right, so, and Council Member Cohen. So I'm, I'm going to get to my last question, question for now. Um, so if, if you're going to go with the RFP for the entire 20 zones, um, how would you determine if, it's, if, it become, if it turns out to be a disaster, how would you go back? Like when, you, um, when sanitation came out with the organics collection, it was a pilot program that started off in a smaller scale and to see how it works, and then you uh, expanded it uh, throughout the city. So how would you how would We're going to put this? the RFP for all 20 zones out at the same time, but that will lead to um, the industry bidding on all the zones at the same time, but the actual rollout will be uh, phased in over uh, at least two years, um, starting with smaller pockets of the city to make sure we do this slowly and thoughtfully and carefully um, so there are not effects to the customers. Do you have, do you have the plan of the rollout? Uh, no, uh, apart from what I've said, it's going to be it's going to be tiered. Um, it's not all going to be at once, and we're not going to rush it. Um, but we do not have a detailed plan yet. But uh, the when, do you, the RFP when do you expect is to get the detailed plan? So when we release the RFP at uh, the beginning of 2020, we should have um, a basic rollout plan as so well. In other words, you're going to wait for the RFP right. to be put out in order to, right. then you're going Council to Council Member uh, Deutsch, I really appreciate it, but you've asked uh, questions. When I said one, you've asked three. I get a lot of courtesy. Thank you very much. I want to allow for Council Member uh, Powers to go, followed by Council Member Cohen, followed by Council Member Brad Lander. For all these Council Members, we've been here for two hours and the, the agencies are still speaking. We have 13 panels that I'm supposed to complete in an hour. Just saying, would appreciate brevity. Thank you, Council Member Powers. Well, how can I follow that? I, um, uh, I'll just forego my questions. I just, I'm here just because I want to reiterate my support. I am ground zero, I believe, for, I have Midtown Manhattan, and I am the place where I think when you talk about examples of how many private carters are on any single block at any single time. You're normally talking about districts like mine, which have a tremendous amount of commercial activity. I actually do think we can do this right, where the small businesses that are impacted and the restaurants and the other small businesses in my district will be, will obviously have concerns around it. I think we can take this bill today and make it so that the small businesses can live and survive and, and be able to um, uh, uh, live under this regime, and it would just clear up so many more issues. So I just wanted to reiterate my support, but I'll forego asking you guys questions out of respect for the time. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Cohen. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I just, I am sympathetic to the idea of the zones. Uh, one thing I guess, uh, you know, some people who have been uh, or more concerned have spoke to me about is, uh, one of the reasons I'm sympathetic is the, your testimony, Commissioner, that you predict that there would be a 50 percent reduction in the amount of traffic miles that these trucks I'd like to be certain of that. I wonder if at some point you could either make available the data, show us the models that, that, that produce that result so that we have confidence that, 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 that we're going to get the benefit of, uh, of this legislation. 
Absolutely, we'd be happy to share the backup data uh, from our draft environmental impact statement to show you how we arrived at the 50% savings of vehicle miles traveled. It's in the DEIS, but we can even give you additional data. We're happy to meet with you if you'd like to. I'd appreciate that. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, that's 18 million mile reduction. Okay, that's uh, Councilmember Lander. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for your leadership on this issue. I'm proud to be a co-sponsor of your bill, and I really want to thank you for the leadership that you have provided. It's great to be here with so many advocates who have been pushing hard for a better system. Uh, I want to thank the administration for the good study that you've done here to help us move forward on this critical issue. And I guess my question gets to, in your report, you know, you identified a lot of challenges. So I support moving to zones, and obviously the VMT reductions are enormous. You also identified um, something that we've stood with, you know, on the challenges for workers and their safety, the challenges for pedestrians and their safety, some of that, certainly pedestrian safety, addressed by less trucks driving around. But on issues of workers' uh, working conditions, quality of life, wages, and on issues of uh, broad sustainability and waste reductions, you also identify a lot of challenges in the commercial waste system and needs to get better. And I'd like to understand, you know, your theory of how this will do it. I mean, obviously, a concern about leaving competition even within zones is that the incentives of trying to go get the best possible price mean you cut corners on wages, mean you cut corners on safety, mean you cut corners on recycling and sustainability. And so um, part of how we're thinking about how to move forward here is how we elevate standards so they're good jobs, they're safe jobs, and we get as much recycling, waste reduction, um, and improvements in sustainability as possible. Um, and to me, that's the piece of it that we really have to figure out together in the, in the coming days. And I would just like to understand better how you think your proposal does that. Thank you for that question. I'm gonna speak to the worker safety and um, worker protection component, and then I'm gonna defer to um, Director Bland to talk about the sustainability portion, um, but if I left anything out, please let me know. Um, so again, thank you for the opportunity to be here. We are thrilled to, to voice the administration's support um, for this bill. Um, there's been a lot of work done by the people in this room, and today is a, a big day. Um, we are also thankful for the opportunity to talk about how we think this bill will, will benefit workers in some very concrete ways. We talked about um, the uh, reduction in unsafe driving and worker fatigue associated with shorter routes. I'm not going to um, speak more about that unless you have follow-up questions. That. From the standpoint of, of worker safety, um, what we learned in our public outreach efforts is that com some companies are not providing basic safety training to their workers. That's pu this puts the public um, at risk and it puts workers at risk. Um, and we believe that um, Intro 1574 will address that. There will be a requirement that all carters provide worker safety training to their workers, including 40 hours of worker safety training to uh, workers who are on the road, such as drivers and helpers. Um, and we're, we're, th we're thrilled that that provision of the bill that we're discussing today includes a requirement that carters have a language access plan to make sure that that training is being provided in, in the language spoken by their workers so that it's, it's meaningful and accessible. Um, beyond that, you talked about um, wage theft and, and um, compliance with, with uh, worker protections and labor and employment laws, and I know the chair has already spoken to this issue. Um, this is something that the administration takes very seriously, um, and we believe that this plan will address that issue at multiple points in the process. So um, one of the benefits of an RFP process is that we're building on top of the licensing scheme that already exists where we can take a closer look at the companies that will be doing business and um, evaluate them based on their record. Um, as we learned from Sanitation Salvage, the choices a company makes and a company's record matters. And so we will be looking at the, the um, company's history of compliance with all applicable laws, including uh, wage and hour laws, minimum wage laws, et cetera. But we're gonna go further than that. Um, we're also gonna require a health and safety plan, which will become part of the binding agreements that the, city's, that the city enters into with the Carters and will be enforceable. Um, additionally, we think that um, 
it is essential that the carters that are selected be able to provide the service safely and efficiently, but also in a way that is legal. And so um, we're going to be asking for a staffing plan that will demonstrate that um, this service can be provided without cutting corners with workers, without violating applicable laws such as um, minimum wage laws and wage and hour laws, and we take that very seriously. And then finally, in terms of um, ongoing compliance, the agreements that the city enters into with the carters will have provisions requiring them to continue to comply with all applicable laws, and we will have contractual remedies to make sure that that happens. So that's all great. I guess I would like you to address the pay question as well. You know, this council just looked into the budget at this issue of pay parity across a lot of different categories, like should teachers in the classroom in our public schools be paid so much more than teachers in the classrooms in CBOs? And I guess I'd just like you to address that here. Obviously, we pay our public sanitation workers a really good living wage because it is a hard, dangerous, backbreaking job. And right now, we're paying our private sanitation workers so much less than that. Like, it makes the pay parity that we just addressed in the uh, daycare sector, I don't want to say look modest because that was bad too, but I mean, is that an issue? Like that's an issue that's on our minds as we're trying to figure out this bill. Um, and I'm not, you know, I think as we move forward here and I'll close out and then turn it back to the chair, we have to find a way to address that and, and we really want to work with you guys to do it. And that'll be the, and as a matter of equity, that'll be the last question that Council Member Lander would ask as we move forward. I'm turning to off the next my panel. microphone. Thank you. Okay. So go ahead, ask, uh, answer that question and we'll move on from there. So on the issue of pay equity, um, we look forward to working with you um, to look at what we can do um, as the City of New York um, to address the issue and happy to follow up with you further, Council Member. I don't know if you want um, Director Blend to talk about the sustainability uh, questions you asked or if we should move on. Oh no, you could answer that. So in short, we're using all the tools we have to further our zero waste goals as well. So we want a robust zero waste plan in the RFP. All the proposals uh, will have a zero waste plan saying how you can process all these materials properly and go above and beyond to make additional commitments. That will get you a higher score when we're determining who gets contracts in which zone. Uh, beyond that, uh, there will be uh, in our contracts with the carters, they will have to offer all recycling services that customers currently have to do, and they will have to offer it at a discount. So customers will have transparent billing that incentivizes them to do the right thing. Thank, thank you for that, and I also want to uh, acknowledge that we've been joined by Council Member Chin. Uh, want to say we've been doing this for two hours, so anyone that just arrived, uh, and we want to make sure that everyone gets an opportunity to speak, and I'm trying to limit that, just let the record know that I was cutting off the pro and the anti folks. So it's, uh, it's been fair. And now we're gonna go through panels, through pro uh, and against, uh, or for and against. So thank you so much for your time. Um, please make yourselves available to any and all council members that want to meet with you hereafter. Um, and I'll be keeping track of any requests that are being made of me for you to meet with them so that we can make sure that they're as informed as possible. Thank you again for your statement. And, um, <laughs> Council Member Chin. Thank you, Chair. Uh, well, uh, Council Member Chin, can you please do the best you can to be as limited Yes, as I just want to ask about rat mitigation. Okay. That if you doing this zone thing, have you consider uh, how to deal with the rats? You know, like garbage on the sidewalk. Are you mandating that they put out in containers? Uh, so that's my question. Uh, right now, the statute doesn't specifically address that. We are happy to discuss that with you. I think that's an excellent idea. Uh, if, if waste can be put in cans or in containers, that's the best way to deter rats. So uh, we are happy to consider that as we move forward with this bill. Thank you. And we'll look, and you, we'll look into that too. We're trying to do that on the public slide, by the way, uh, Council Member Chin, to move garbage to corners instead of allowing for people to put it right in front of their homes. And that'll be another fight for another day. Uh, but again, thank you so much for your testimony and appreciate your time. And now we're going to call our first panel. And I'm just going to put this out there. If you heard something that was stated by someone previously, you don't need to make the point again. That's the first thing. The second thing is all your testimony will be submitted if you have it in writing is submitted on the record so if you feel you don't need to repeat or read your testimony word for word take out the points 
that you think are most important and that you want to make. In some cases, reiterating points does make sense, so go ahead. But please, let's be as efficient as possible. Don't say the same thing three times. This is going to be, I want it to be meaningful, and I want to make sure that there's points that we didn't hit get hit. So the next panel is going to be Kevin Drew, Mary Cleaver, Sean Campbell, Rolando Guzman, and Ayad. I'll give by, I'm going to try this. I'll go Biali. Thank you. Sorry about that. Thank you, man. I'm so sorry. It's, we're gonna, they're going to kick us out for the broker's hearing. Thank you, and we're gonna go from right to left, and we're gonna put two minutes on the clock. And that, I wanna say, that's a generous two minutes. Remember, make a point um, and be as uh, concise as possible. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you, council members. Uh, my name is Ayad El Gabiela Yel, and I'm the director of advocacy at the Yemeni American Merchants Association, a grassroots nonprofit organization that was birthed from the hugely successful bodega strike in New York City and opposing the Muslim ban of uh, the Trump administration. Um, I'm here testifying on behalf of our 5,000 uh, small bodegas in uh, partnership with Align New York and other uh, allies for private hauling reform and in support of the zone system. Yemeni American uh, bodegas account uh, for thousands uh, four thousands of small businesses throughout New York City. These bodegas support their li their livelihood and current uh, and current garbage hauling system has resulted in steep decrease in revenues for their uh, businesses. Our community has worked very hard to raise, uh, to raise the, themselves uh, to a comfortable standard of living, uh, living by following the law when it comes to the uh, proper disposal of their garbage and recycling, but it seems that the system has not been working in, the, in their favor. Our merchants are uh, constantly hit by their uh, by sanitation tickets left and right without education educational uh, and proper resource it is um, it's as if they are uh, forced into a uh, position and are penalized when doing their best to follow the law without any re uh, repercussion uh, to the uh, to the parties hired um, to help them it's hard enough uh, owning a small business uh, in New York City today uh, with many of the competitions as stated before. Um, and reforms like this make it easier and is needed. Uh, and we hope to work with you guys and all of you and our allies here to make it um, you know, better and uh, reform this uh, you know, with possible. Thank you for your testimony, and we really appreciate the work you do. You guys have really set the standard for uh, social justice advocacy by, by merchants and by business owners, so I really appreciate you being here. Thank you so much for your testimony. Councilmember Reno, so I'm testifying on behalf of Sean Campbell, the president of Teamsters Local 813. The Teamsters are the largest sanitation union in New York City, representing public and private sector sanitation workers. At institutions and companies large and small, our members work on garbage trucks and transfer stations and in recycling facilities. I grew up in Red Hook, in NYCHA. A job in the private carding industry took me from the projects to owning my own home and sending my kids to college. But that was another era. Today, at many carding companies, a young person would be lucky to get paid minimum wage with almost no benefits. Forget about a pension. That is why we need the exclusive commercial waste zoning legislation proposed by Council Member Reynoso.
We need one carter per zone because that is the only way to clean up this industry. With exclusive zones, there will be a stable customer base. Responsible employers will have predictable revenue and can invest in these jobs. They can commit to fair wages, good benefits, and safety programs. They can commit to all of those things without another carter who treats its workers like trash, offering to charge a dollar less per ton. I understand that big business likes the way things are now. The developers and their lobbyists have been fighting this bill from day one. The lobbyists for the other big corporations have been fighting this bill as well. These companies weren't complaining when the workers who picked up the trash were going home with broken arms, lacerations, or worse. None of them were standing with us after a 21-year-old African immigrant was killed on the job, and it was covered up. But when these workers are just about to get their rights, the big corporations are all of a sudden concerned. They like the current system where workers get scraps, small businesses pay way more, and the corporations get the benefits. They want non-exclusive zones so that the bad carters can slip through the cracks and stay in the industry. I hope our council members will stand with these workers, the communities, the big businesses, and the environmentalists to pass this bill. Thank you. And um, as an aside, my name is Bernadette Kelly. I'm an international representative for the International Brotherhood of Teamsters. I am the daughter of a sanitation worker who was a shop steward at Teamsters Local 831 of the Uniform Sanitation Men. And I can say that zoning works because my family thrived under zoning. He was a Department of Sanitation man, and I'm his daughter. Thank you. Thank you. It's now good afternoon. Um, my name is Mary Cleaver, and 38 years ago, I founded and have been running ever since Cleaver Co., a food business here in New York City, focused on serving high-quality food sourced largely from regional farms practicing regenerative agriculture. At Cleaver Co., we care deeply about where our food comes from and also about where it goes. I strongly support Councilmember Reynoso's bill to establish a commercial waste zone system in New York City for many reasons, but largely because it will help mitigate global warming, the greatest challenge upon us. The commercial waste zones bill would make our commercial waste system more energy and emissions efficient, as well as far safer for workers and for neighborhoods. In addition to making our streets safer and our air cleaner, this is an enormous opportunity to make our city's entire business sector more environmentally focused by expanding waste reduction services of recycling, composting, and food rescue to every customer. By selecting one private sanitation provider per district, we can hold that company accountable to high environmental and customer service standards. Businesses will no longer need to search for a company that will compost organics. Currently, composting services are limited and difficult to obtain, especially for small and independent businesses like Cleaver Co. At all the commercial locations my business is operated in, I've had to research a waste provider willing to accept food waste for composting, I've had to negotiate over prices, and I've had to push to try to ensure that the price for compost isn't higher than the price for sending waste to a landfill. Business owners shouldn't have to make an extraordinary effort to obtain sensible, sustainable waste services. Affordable compost and recycling services should be available to every and all New York City businesses that need them, and pricing and service should be transparent and trustworthy. Intro 574 would do just this. The bill requires selected waste haulers to provide organics and recycling service to every customer who wants them and gives haulers strong incentives to improve the facilities and trucks needed to scale up and make these services affordable. With more composting of organics, we can turn food waste into topsoil to grow food rather than sending it to the landfill to emit methane and increase global warming. On behalf of thousands of entrepreneurs and business owners across our city who care deeply about our environmental footprint, our impact on climate change, and our shared future, I urge the City Council to follow other cities like San Francisco, Seattle, and Los Angeles. Pass Thank this you. bill and effect positive change. In Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, uh, councilors. My name is Kevin Drew. I'm with the City of San Francisco. I'm the Residential uh, Zero Waste Senior Coordinator. I've been in that position for 18 years. Uh, and a prior to that, I was running uh, recycling programs in the City of San Francisco for about 12 years, so I have over 30 years' experience. Uh, San Francisco has used a, an exclusive uh, collection system to reach an over 80% uh, reutilization of the materials in our, that come into our city. Uh, 
This creates a local circular economy that continues to improve efficiency uh, more and better, creates more and better jobs, and can reinvigorate the environment by putting those materials back into the, into the natural systems. Uh, we have a deep, a deep understanding of the complexities uh, and the controversy that accompany exclusive arrangement. Uh, we are ready and willing to share our experience and lessons learned uh, with uh, the city of San, with, excuse me, with the city of New York. Uh, and we Can are- I, I'm sorry, one second. Can I get a pause on the clock on this one? So this is a, uh, an example of way zoning in San Francisco. And there's been a lot of conversations about someone, another city and that has done it. So I want to give you the time to be able to really speak to your experience because I think that, it, it, that um, even though all testimonies are significant, this is one perspective that we really haven't heard yet. So please uh, continue. Thank you. Uh, and I, I, I want to say that what, as I just mentioned, we are uh, ready to help in any way that we can, both here today and, 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 and after this meeting. I'm happy to talk with other uh, uh, counselors and with city staff. Uh, as well, I'll be around tomorrow, and we're obviously available by electronically in whatever way necessary to address specific questions. Some of the questions that the counselors had earlier today are ones that I would talk about. Uh, for instance, the uh, the question uh, came up around uh, the comparison, the rate comparison. Our rates are comparable comparable with other Bay Area cities. Uh, and as well, in terms of working with small businesses, we spend a lot of time working with the small business community. I understand that you've done that kind of work, but that work is never uh, unnecessary or you can't do too much of it. Uh, maintaining the service level is key and maintaining the rates is key. We are, I am a member of our rate review committee in, in San Francisco. We are overseeing the exclusive franchise arrangement very carefully. Uh, we have excellent customer service uh, that is Recology is the service provider in our case. Uh, one of my particular jobs is to uh, see that any complaints that come up are addressed by Recology or by the city in terms of maintaining the rates or maintaining the services uh, that are agreed upon in the, uh, the, uh, our agreement, our, our service agreement. So I wanted to assure folks that there is a way to address the concerns, whether it's customer service, uh, competitive prices, uh, maintenance of the system. Like one key thing is that there is a cost to putting a good system into place. Uh, it, it, is, it is not inexpensive, but it does not have to break the bank. And as I see the amount of savings that you're uh, calculating, reinvesting that into the system to create a good infrastructure uh, and a good a, a, a competitive system but also a system that's overseen by uh, by Department of Sanitation and the BIC uh, that is I think that's very doable and we're happy to show you how we do it in San Francisco uh, and, or to come here and help work with you to make that transition I think um, yeah just summarizing uh, uh, the opportunity for New York City to lead the way in terms of creating a commercial system that really gets at its uh, recovery of the resources that are available in this city is just gigantic in terms of a global leadership, in terms of uh, what we have to do on the planet to, to solve the problem of, cli of uh, climate crisis. We, are, we have invented some things in San Francisco or discovered some things in San Francisco that I think are very replicable in other cities. And we, are, we really uh, trust on other cities' abilities to take that leap and go to the same place we're going and make that happen. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I really appreciate it. Rolando? Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Rolando Guzman, and I'm here uh, testifying on behalf of uh, Outrage. Organizations United for Trash Reduction and Garbage Equity. We are an environmental justice organization in North Brooklyn, and I just uh, want to summarize. Uh, I think we all know that North Brooklyn, along with South Bronx and sections of Queens, we have to deal with uh, pretty much all New York City garbage. We have, to, we have the concentration of waste transfer stations and also garages for discarding companies. Uh, we have the highest, one of the highest rates of asthma in the entire city. And uh, we believe that that is environmental racism. Uh, these are communities of low-income communities of color. Uh, we think that the city is doing steps in the right direction. We are happy that the um, waste equity bill passed last year. Uh, and we believe this is another step in the right direction. Uh, I think uh, uh, we, we think that the uh, commercial waste zoning is uh, a great tool that is going to bring equity as well. 
One thing, though, that we are concerned, and I think um, uh, we hope that it's going to be addressed in this legislation, is about the air quality. Uh, we have a lot of those trucks uh, parked in our community, and they are going to be, even though that they are not going to pick up garbage within North Brooklyn, they are going to be coming and going from our community. So one thing that we want to stress is the need that this new fleet of commercial waste trucks, they have to be close as possible to zero emissions. Uh, they have the technology, there's a technology available, and uh, it's an, invest uh, an investment that these companies should be doing because we need air quality, especially in North Brooklyn. I thank you so much, uh, Council Member Reynoso, for your leadership on this issue. Thank you, I appreciate it. I know that um, even though there's been a significant reduction in the amount of uh, pollution that like, for example, the white DSNY trucks do, we've fallen short in the commercial vehicle side, and we actually think DSNY could do more. So we're, we're conscious of that. I know it's not in the plan right now, but we'll definitely be paying attention to that. I thank wanna you. thank this entire panel for uh, your testimony, um, and we will be reaching out to our, each and every one of you if we need more assistance, so thank you so much. Thank you. Um, our next panel, uh, Steve Changaris from uh, NWRA, uh, Zach Steinberg from the Rebney, um, Kendall Christensen from uh, NYRWM, uh, Adam Mitchell from Mr. T. Carding, and the New Yorkers for Responsible Waste Management on NYWARM, Isaac Jordan. And, and I know folks expected to be gone by one o'clock and they have other engagements and other uh, commitments, but unfortunately it's, been, it's gonna be very difficult for us to accommodate you know, requests to, to testify early. Um, we're down to 11 panels, I guess is what I'm saying. So thank you. Um, I wanna start from, well, we we'll let Kendall go first. Kendall, you wanna start on your side, on the right side? Thank you, Mr. Christensen. Uh, give me a second to pull out my testimony. Then let's start from the other side then. Let's start from uh, left to right, so go ahead. Hello, my name is Adam Mitchell. I took a vacation today, today to come and share my views on your legislative proposal. I split the last 30 years between New York City and Boston uh, in both ownership roles and employee uh, in the commercial waste industry. Uh, formerly a member of the Queen Solid Waste Advisory Board, consultant to DSNY in the 90s. I was even a, a lecturer at NYU on waste and recycling and a member of Mayor Dinkins' Blue Ribbon Committee on Market Development. Today I manage a sales team of eight people at Mr. T. Carding, a 70-year-old independent locally owned company based in Brooklyn and Queens. Why does this proposal to create exclusive monopoly zones concern me? Three different ways. First, the customer's perspective. There's nothing more frustrating for a business owner than not being able to choose their vendors. And locking in one vendor to five vendors for 10, 15 years will produce immense outcry from your constituents in the business community. Number two, waste reduction goals. There have been mandatory recycling regulations on the books here in New York City for years, since the 90s. But they're so lightly enforced by DSNY, it's as if they don't exist. For the underinformed. The propaganda espoused by folks like Justin Woods from New York Lawyers for Public Interest would make it seem that it's the commercial waste industry's fault that more recycling isn't happening in New York City, and that's a blatant lie. At my company, last year, we recycled and composted 36% of the material that our customers set out for recycling. And we want to do more, but we need a willing enforcement partner. And without adequate funding for DSNY, the City Council and the mayor's office is just gonna kick enforcement can down the road. Number three, economic perspective. The root of this proposal amazes me. It it's, amazes me that it's being promoted in a progressive city like ours. If you vote for this proposal or the hybrid proposal we'll see shortly, you'll expedite the expropriation of capital by government without compensation. To quote Elizabeth Warren, there is way too much consolidation now in giant industries in this country. It hurts workers, it hurts independent locally owned businesses, it hurts our economy overall. And it helps constrict real innovation and growth in this economy. I think your proposal is a wolf in sheep's clothing. 
It's a giveaway that's greater than the Amazon deal that many of you re rejected. Please, I urge you to vote no on this proposal. Thank you for your testimony. I'm, I'm going to call Elizabeth Warren and see where she stands on this issue. <laughs> <laughs> and see, see whose side she'll be on. Uh, but thank you. Uh, thank smart. you, uh, Mr. Chairman. My name is Steve Changaris. I'm with the National Waste and Recycling Association. I submitted some copies of the testimony, mostly on the bills that no one's discussed about today that's on your agenda. I just want to real quickly say that if, if those bills were passed or worked on, we, we, don't, we, we endorse some of the concepts, we like some of the bills, but a lot of the work that if you did on those bills and improved them, you would drive um, the, the, the trade waste practices in the city tremendously close to where you want to be. But uh, because everyone's on uh, the, the 1574 bill today uh, at, with, the, with the waste zones. Uh, I just want to remind the committee that um, the uh, chapter's formal position on the, on the creation of the new commercial zo uh, zones has already been made known. We would prefer the city to focus on improving the current trade waste collection system instead of creating a completely new governmentally, governmentally mandated uh, zone collection system. Um, but that said, uh, and notwithstanding if all the other measures were put into place, if, you do, if, the, if the choice of the city and in the, in the intergovernmental process is to continue to go down the path of the, the zone collection system, um, the, the idea is uh, we don't believe that, um, you know, we, we, the one uh, hauler per zone is the preferred view for this time. Uh, the, 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 we don't believe third-party audits will be necessary. Um, if they are required, it'll create a whole new unnecessary cottage industry and uh, related expenses uh, that will be paid by the city businesses who are our customers. Um, and also, um, if an, ex an exclusive zone system is adopted, there will be no need for the traditional rate cap controls in place today. Um, th that's going to be the case since, the, as it's been said before, the new trade waste rates and the services mandated are, uh, to the city businesses will be based on the material volume charges created through the private sector zone competition process and will be accepted only after full city review uh, of the, uh, an, ex an exclusive zone contract award procedures establishing that they are most appropriate rates to be charged under the new system. We look forward to continue to working with you and you know, uh, we're going to stay involved uh, through the end of this. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. Yeah, do you want to, we're going to go back to the left side, so you can, you can test. Hi, it. my name is Isaac Jordan. I am New Yorkers responsible for waste management. I'm going to make mine very short and to the point. It's basically just uh, standing for the basic New Yorker workers who are the owners of uh, uh, carting companies that are generations of uh, companies that have been here in New York that are small business owners. And these small business owners are going to be swallowed up and they are going to be not able to employ um, workers. Workers are going to lose jobs. Jobs will be lost if there are only two uh, companies controlling the um, waste management in the city. And it would be just like Wall Street uh, losing jobs that will leave and never come back. We will not see these jobs come back uh, for those people that lose their jobs, <clears throat> especially in uh, minority neighborhoods, which are, will be affected and impacted uh, by this decision. So um, New York is about the small businesses and this will be affected by those businesses that are owned and have made New York what it is today. New York is about the business owners that have been here for generations and for two companies to just run uh, the waste management in New York would create chaos for the businesses that have been here for generations and employ people that are in those neighborhoods. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. I want to speak from the perspective of the large commercial properties who make up uh, Rebney's membership. Um, receiving the highest quality waste removal services is of paramount importance to large commercial property owners. 
In these large buildings, effectively managing trash and recycling requires hard work and careful coordination from the time a cleaning staff starts working at 6 p.m. to the time that a truck arrives in the loading dock to remove the waste, which is often between 2 and 6 o'clock in the morning. Successfully completing this operation is essential so that tenants conduct their daily commerce in a pleasant environment, companies can meet their environmental stewardship and waste diversion goals, and communities can remain desirable places to live, work, and visit. This is why we are uh, deeply concerned about the impact of Intro 1574. Under this proposal, if an authorized carding company were to fall short of its responsibilities, New York City businesses would have no ability to change companies in order to have their garbage and recycling collected in a timely, reliable manner. Competition in this mean does not just mean through an RFP process, but it means the ability of a business to terminate a contract and choose a different vendor with whom to work. Without the flexibility to change carters, owners would have limited ability to receive customized service to meet their unique needs. Indeed, it would take only one missed pickup or a slight erosion in service for a building to smell, trash to spill on the street, and quality of life to erode. Large commercial offices are very different than, small, than the small businesses who put trash out each night on the street and have it picked up in, by, a, by a truck. For particularly large commercial properties that utilize compactors and other containers to manage their waste, these trucks who service these buildings go from the building to the transfer station with no intervening stops. Any regulatory system imposed upon these owners offers no environmental benefits in the form of reduction of vehicle miles traveled. There, all it does is risk constraining the ability of those businesses to obtain high quality service, and these are the businesses who produce the most waste in the city. On this basis, we hope that you will uh, see that any reform proposal will preserve the ability of these properties to obtain services from as many qualified companies as possible. Thank you. And just, uh, just for a heads up, the concern that you have related to the one truck coming in, one truck coming out, um, if a net neutral environmentally is something that we're looking into with the Department of Sanitation, so I just want you to know it's something that we are paying attention to um, in relation to, to your concern. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Councilman, uh, so, uh, Councilman, I'm going to let uh, Christensen speak, and then you can speak to the entire panel. So, uh, Kendall, you make your testimony, and then Councilman Rodeuch for questions. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I did submit uh, testimony. Hopefully you have it. Um, any resemblance to monopoly cards is intentional. Um, so um, I'm not going to summarize it uh, by any stretch. I thought it would make it easier for you to sort of flip through and see that uh, there's a section about uh, understanding the commercial waste system as it currently exists. There's five pages on understanding what's happened in LA, including the recent increase in illegal dumping in downtown LA that's attributed to Recycle LA. Uh, there's a page on the DSNY near monopoly plan, uh, high risk, low reward. Uh, there's a page, Mr. Chairman, on what happens when you use a stick to regulate um, and how you can get it wrong and uh, cause a lot of damage. And then there's a page on uh, intro 990, uh, 996 uh, being a better choice to sooner, better, cheaper achieve the, uh, the various goals that have been uh, discussed today. But what I want to begin uh, with an anecdote that's on page two. Uh, I happened, uh, because of term limits, none of you were here, but I happened to be in the back of the chamber in 1996 when the Trade Waste Act was adopted. And I had been working for a local company that had been acquired by one of the large national companies and met their uh, lobbyist uh, in the back uh, in that hallway. And I posed the question, uh, what's their projection for the industry then, five years from that point? And his answer uh, verbatim was, quote, three companies left standing and prices through the roof, unquote. Uh, that didn't happen. The local industry uh, rallied to the uh, changes in the, uh, the law and the, uh, how the industry was uh, structured and uh, met the requirements of creating a uh, competitive uh, industry with a fair choice for customers and the like. Four national companies have tried to operate in New York and have given up uh, because the local companies do it better, and that's who I'm uh, here to represent uh, today on behalf of the New Yorkers for Responsible Waste Management, which is a consortium of about 25 locally owned and operated waste and recycling service companies, uh, most of them with multi-generational service to the city. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kendall. Council Member Deutsch for questions. Thank you. Uh, I just have a, it's a yes and no, or no answer. Did, uh, what conversations did any of you have uh, prior to today in regards to intro 1570, 1574 with your concerns uh, with this committee uh, or with sanitation department or any other New York City entity? 
Uh, I'll respond to that, Jen. Yeah, okay. um, so uh, uh, I, be, I participated in the DSNY advisory board. Uh, I would say that uh, there was never any vote taken at that advisory board, about 35 people, to either endorse the DSNY plan or the uh, 1574 that's before uh, the committee today. Uh, the one zone plan was never really uh, the one. The monopoly zone plan was never really discussed in that advisory board process. Uh, I have met with some of you individually as members, uh, but we've not really had a full sit down uh, with the chairman or staff and would welcome the opportunity to do that. Thank you. And I just want to get an answer from everyone. Meech. I'm very similar to Kendall. Kendall, we participated in, in the zone advisory board meetings. We've been before Chairman Reynoso. We've been active with the BIC, and th this issue has always been in the ether and every place we go. Because this is, again, I made a, a general comment to my members in preparing testimony. There, and I mentioned it earlier, the bills on the agenda are the ascent, essence to make this industry better in this state, in this city, uh, as opposed to the zone collection. The elements of those bills on your agenda today are gonna be the elements in the RFPs the DSNY put out. So, and it gets back to what, what, what other uh, councilmen have said, those elements of those bills in the current model, you can drive the, uh, uh, this ball way down the course. Well, I would second that. In fact, much of 1574 is good stuff. It's all best practices. It's all the direction that the industry would prefer to go rather than fighting over the politics of zones. Um, and so there's much in that that was discussed in the advisory board process, much of which is industry best practice already and is uh, worth discussing as to find alternate ways to achieve it, uh, and particularly through the framework of 996 that preserves the open market system but uh, creates a framework for how to move forward on those issues. Thank you. Anyone else? Anything to add? Uh, we even enjoyed the opportunity to visit with you and uh, you know, other council members, the chairman, his staff, uh, the administration, and appreciate the open door and the ability to communicate. President of the organization and Mr. T. Carding is a member of the advisory board. Uh, I've had uh, informal conversations with Asher Freeman about the bill. I uh, have met with two city councilors to talk about that as well as other environmental issues. Anything to add? No. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I appreciate it. The next uh, group is. Uh, Plinio Cruz Alvarez. Clive Austin. Dan Gabby. Adam Cope. And Brendan, Brendan Sexton. I just want to say, when you fill out these cards, I'm supposed to read them. Uh, and, you know, I went to Catholic school, so the nuns would have been very upset with the, the handwriting of some of these. All right, uh, you want to start? Yeah, can you hit the, can you click the, the mic to make sure that we can hear you? All right, great. My name is Daniel Gabay. I was born in New York and I've resided in Manhattan for most of my adult life. I've watched sanitation vehicles go through red lights, speed down our streets, hug curbs near pedestrians, and I've often seen them go the wrong way on one-way streets. I've always heard stories of people being killed and severely injured by these trucks, but never thought it would be me, especially considering how careful I always was with everything. On November, on November 8th, 2015, that changed. I biked home from work, hugging the right side of the street, as I always did, when a waste vehicle was speeding down Houston Street. He had so much room, and for a split second, we were parallel, but then he started to hug the curve, and the back two wheels of his vehicle sucked my body in. Then his 20,000-pound vehicle pulverized my body against the pavement, dragging me for 20 feet before he finally stopped. It was the most blood I had ever seen in my life, and it was coming out of me. My femoral artery was severed, and the doctor said I had lost over 70% of my blood before I arrived at the hospital. 
After my first surgery, my family asked if I would live, and the doctor said, although he has somehow survived up until this point, it is unlikely his heart will be able to take the trauma that has occurred to his body, so it is still likely he will die. My body was mutilated, and what followed was 150 days of uncontrollable screaming because of my extreme pain. I've suffered in ways that most people could never comprehend and in ways much more graphic than I choose to describe here. I've lost many things that I will never get back, and the person who did this to me is walking around more free than I may ever be. I was in pain when I wrote this, and almost every day of my life in the past three and a half years has included excruciating physical pain. However, my battle with my pain and the emotional things that come along with it belong to me. I'm not here for me. I'm only here because I know I have to do whatever is in my power to make sure this doesn't happen to anybody else. My pain will continue, but the conditions which led to my crash and others' injuries and deaths must change. Private sanitation trucks are obviously not well regulated. The driver who did this was likely under the influence, but was somehow able to avoid testing. The company the driver employed, the, the company the driver was employed by had prior crashes, but somehow had no issues being insured and literally nothing stopping them from being on the road. The company who owned the vehicle and employed the driver didn't have to pay anything. They didn't have to stop their business and were able to continue with no issues even after admitting fault. The ripple effect of the, that these crashes have on friends, families, and sometimes even whole communities is irreversible. The pain in the eyes of my parents and the hundred or so people who visited me in the hospital was so terrible that it still haunts me. The fact that all these things mentioned above could occur in a place as civilized as New York City is almost unbelievable. It seems there's almost nothing to protect the flesh of human beings against the reckless driving and dangerous design of these multi-ton trucks. I'm almost done, by the way. <laughs> This is why legislation is needed. In other cities like LA, Seattle, and San Francisco, where there are exclusive waste zone systems, the top companies have just one third of the crashes per driver compared to what we have in NYC. Although my survival may be unique, this situation unfortunately isn't. When something so terrible keeps consistently happening over and over by the drivers of these trucks, it's a no-brainer that we must stop it. Please don't let people die and suffer in vain for what could easily be avoided. Families for Safe Streets strongly supports Intro 1574 and hope the City Council passes it as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, really appreciate it. Uh, and all that Family for Safe Streets does. And it's, it's unfortunate to even say that you're actually one of the lucky ones, right? Um, it's, it's a sad thing, but I appreciate your advocacy and you being here and giving us your testimony about uh, unfo your unfortunate incident. Thank you. Hello, thank you for having us here today. My name is Blythe Austin. I am a crash survivor and work with crash survivors and the families of crash victims who did not survive. As you know, large trucks are involved in a disproportionate number of traffic deaths in our city. The sheer size of these trucks mean that the trucks operate like tanks rolling through our communities. You just heard Dan's story. You've also heard about the death three days ago of Robin Heitman who was hit from behind by a tractor trailer with such force that they flew several feet through the air before being crushed under the wheels of the truck. Their bicycle and their corpse were left in mangled pieces across 6th Avenue. Or the death of Arilla Lawrence last February. Arilla's entire body was crushed under the wheels of an oil truck from the bottom of her feet to the top of her head. Garbage trucks crushing people is tragically common. Families for Safe Streets has two members who each had a leg amputated after it was crushed under the wheels of a garbage truck. Jed McGriffith was walking across 6th Avenue in the crosswalk with the right-of-way when he was hit by a garbage truck driver and lost his entire left leg up to his hip bone. His injuries required 20 surgeries. He spent six weeks in a medically induced coma and eight weeks in the ICU. Lauren Pine was also crossing the street in the crosswalk with the right-of-way when a garbage truck driver hit her and then dragged her down the street until bystanders got the driver to stop. Like Jed, Lauren lost her entire left leg. In addition, her pelvis was shattered, her bladder ripped, and she had large burn-like wounds down the entirety of her remaining leg. She spent two months in the hospital. What happened to Jed and Lauren and Dan could happen to any of us. Large trucks are a menace on our streets. Since 2010, 26 people have been killed by private garbage trucks alone. There are too many garbage trucks on our streets and they are killing people. As part of your job to keep New Yorkers safe, you must take steps to minimize the prevalence of these vehicles. Intro 1574 will do just that. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. 
We appreciate you again, the organization. Thank you so much for everything you're doing when it comes to advocacy related to transportation issues. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Good afternoon and thank you for the opportunity. I'm uh, proud to share heritage with uh, you, Chair Antonio Reynoso. Many years ago, I came as an undocumented alien to the United States, to this great nation. Uh, eventually, I became a citizen. I attended City College. Uh, I went back to the Dominican Republic to work there for seven years. When I came back, uh, the job offers were not that attractive, so I became a garbage man. Because going through college, most kids wanted to be either policemen, firemen, or garbage men. Not because it is an easy job, it is a tough, dangerous job. However, they will, get, they will get good pay and good benefits when they are properly represented. Unfortunately, our industry, the private sanitation industry, is, is in a race to the bottom. We have those companies that appear to be good companies like Mr. T. Cutting. I heard the man uh, testify before. I used to work for Mr. T. For, for Mr. T. Cutting, so I know who Mr. T. Cutting is. Uh, I have an example of a brother that worked for them for like about 10 years. He contracted cancer working from them, and they even denied their own employment. And since they don't have a good union anymore, where they have a fake union like many we have here in New York, he had to come to the Teamsters, and we fought for him, and he got his unemployment. That's Mr. T. Karin. I got fired because I was the face of the real union there, and my last two weeks of pay, I never got and they have all kinds of excuses. That's the kind of companies that we have running New York uh, private sanitation. So we need this bill. We have to change the way this uh, industry is run. We care about the environment, and, and it gets to me the fact that most people that are against this bill don't think about the human beings. The human resource, the most important thing, environment, safety, and the people who do the job, we should be caring about that. That's the most important thing, in my opinion. So please, we need this bill. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Hi. Uh, I, my note said good morning, but that's incorrect. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. I'm Brendan Sexton. I'm a member of and former chair of the Manhattan Solid Waste Advisory Board. And uh, I do want to uh, obey your instruction not to repeat what's already been said by many. We are very, the Salary Waste Advisory Board is very supportive of 1574. We've been in favor of zones and franchise-like systems for as long as I've been involved in it. It's over a decade now. We do support this bill with some adjustments, and I'll try to be very brief. One is uh, on the question of multiple or single co uh, contractors per zone. We, the board, frankly, has advocates of both positions, but uh, we have come down in favor of allowing uh, businesses to choose more than, from more than one offering. And so we support the commissioner's proposal, which was for three to five quarters per zone. Uh, I, I must say, as a former uh, executive of the Department of Sanitation, the notion that if I had a, a zone and a problem with the quarter in that zone, and I had someone else who was already serving other customers in that zone that I could switch to, I would appreciate that greatly as a management tool. The sal salvage, san sanitation salvage example is a good one. Companies go bankrupt or are wrong. To have someone to switch to is important. Second, I would like to see greater emphasis to recycling and wa zero waste uh, in the requirements. Uh, the truth is most people don't want to think about this, but that almost certainly means composting. That's the one proportion of our waste which is poorly recycled now, and without some legislative impetus, uh, it will never be uh, recycled greatly, I don't think. Uh, finally, an issue no one has mentioned, micro haulers. We deal a lot at the Solid Waste Advisory Board because we're a citizen group. We deal with citizen recyclers, community gardens, and others. And the bill now has a very restrictive requ uh, requirement on what qualifies you for uh, legally being a micro hauler. It says you have to do fewer than 60 tons per year, which is really much too small. We would probably suggest Micro haulers could go, go up to 10,000 tons a year before requiring a, a permit as a commercial carpet. 
and I'm being crowded out. But at any rate, um, thank you for the opportunity to speak, and we are generally very supportive of the bill. We do uh, not think the monopolistic approach is the preferable one. We do think that the RFP uh, process will allow for high quality service, especially recycling and organics, and we uh, appreciate the chance to work with you further on it. Thank you. So, and just uh, if you can, the, can the Manhattan Swab send us uh, their, their concerns uh, in writing, unless we already have them? Uh, and I just want to acknowledge that uh, Brendan Sexton is the former commissioner to the Department of Sanitation. I want to thank you for taking the time. You're also you. the, the person with the sloppy handwriting that I was talking about, Brendan. I almost, <laughs> I almost couldn't read that it was you. Um, <laughs> But, uh, but thank you for your testimony, and thank please, you. if you could get that information to me, it would be helpful. Thank you. Thank you. And now we have um, uh, Adam Cope, um, who's actually from, yeah, from, from Oakland, uh, who's also going to be able to speak to us. Uh, so please. Uh, good afternoon, council members. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm out here from Oakland. I represent a nonprofit conservation corps, Civic Corps Schools. Um, we have two separate social enterprises. One is land management contracts, which I... I directly oversee, but we also have a recycling social enterprise. In 2014, we were written into the franchise agreement with waste management through the city of Oakland, and that allowed us to be one of the smaller players as far as commercial recycling and organics. Without that franchise agreement and being written into it and having that support, we would never be able to have right now, which is one of our most successful social enterprises, the recycling program. Um, it's a, a free apprenticeship program that allows us to work directly with, with the Teamsters Union. And we are able to essentially have a training program that guides our young folks as they're going through our program directly into family sustaining jobs with the Teamsters Union. And eventually, they walk into full-time jobs with waste management. Um, there was a lot of opposition at first to, to this, a lot of trepidation with waste management, with the union. Um, however, we're providing union members. We're also providing a valuable service to the city of Oakland with streamlined recycling services that we are extremely capable of doing and extremely resp um, responsive. So I think it's a model that could be replicated and works well. I think that it also proves that you can work with larger agencies and, and break pieces off and work with unions and nonprofits together symbiotically and it's it's proven and I hope it's replicable here too. So thank you for your testimony. So it, it seems like LA is the only city that's doing uh, zoning when it comes to the arguments that people make on whether it's successful or not. But we've already heard from uh, San Francisco and now Oakland about the successes that they've had. And you're very rarely brought up in, in the conversations that we have. But um, I, I do appreciate uh, your testimony and your experience. Um, it tends to be when we do meaningful things here in the city council that um, a lot of folks believe the sky is falling um, and they present uh, doomsday scenarios. Uh, and that happens almost every single time. Again, I think a meaningful piece of legislation happens. And this city, New York City, is a perfect example of one where the sky is very rarely have ever fallen. This guy's not falling. Uh, it, it doesn't. Um, so uh, I, don't, I don't believe that that's the case. I don't think there's a doomsday scenario here. I feel like we're very resilient. Um, as New Yorkers, we figure it out always. And uh, the Department of Sanitation is actually in this city. The Department of Sanitation is very, wants to be as flexible as possible, and it's taking its time to present this in three to four years to make sure that the rollout is as successful as possible. There's no rush, and we want to get this right. So I, I do appreciate your testimony. And we are falling. We do need to have conversations here about the work of recycling for organics and smaller, like what we call micro haulers here um, that we've kind of left out. So we are having discussions with the Department of Sanitation to allow for, not necessarily non-for-profits, but in some cases they are, but just these smaller haulers um, that are doing good work. And then that whole apprenticeship conversation, um, if we do this work, uh, there's an assumption being made that many of the larger companies uh, that are doing the right thing and are probably grade high here um, have high standards for workers. Um, that tend to have Teamsters uh, or unions in them, real unions in them, and we're hoping that that could lead to more high-quality work for the workers. Yeah, lead to more high-quality jobs. Too. Yes, exactly. So thank you again for your testimony. We appreciate it. To this panel, thank you again. Appreciate it. Thank you, sir.
This is gonna be the last panel that we have in this room. After this, we have to move to a smaller room because there's gonna, there's 400 people waiting outside for the next hearing. Um, so we're gonna have this, this group and then we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, about nine panels left. Uh, so we're gonna go with uh, Ron Bergamini from Action, Anthony Carmona from, a the, from Waste Connections, uh, Dr. Tok Oyewole from the Environmental Justice Alliance, yes. Uh, Eric McClure from Streets Pack, and Chio Valerio Gonzalez uh, from Align. So we're gonna start from on down, yes. Uh, good afternoon, my name is Anthony Carmona. I've been working uh, in the sanitation industry for five years. Uh, I started my first two years working with Viking Sanitation. Um, they're uh, a family owned company. I wasn't given any, uh, when I first started, I was just told hop on the back of the truck and uh, do the job. I wasn't given no safety gear, safety equipment. Um, I wasn't given any training of how to properly hold on to the back of the truck. I wasn't given anything to anything that I needed to do to do my job. I wasn't given. Um, a couple months passed, almost, almost a year, and uh, a couple of the guys, this, um, well, not a couple, everybody in the company decided to go union, and um, we decided to go with 813, 813 Seamsters. So uh, when the boss found out that we was trying to unionize, he started pulling each of us to the side, offering us money and, and false promises that he was gonna give us so we don't go union on him. Oh, what happened? It worked, we didn't go union. What happened? He decided to cut my days because he found out I was one of the main union supporters. So I was given less pay, less days of work, and uh, you know, that messes, that messes with somebody, you know? used to work in a certain amount, used to getting paid a certain amount. You know, you want that every week, constantly. But no. So what happens now? Um, I'm part of 813 now. They fought for me to get, my, to get me into Waste Connections. I work for Waste Connections. I've been working at Waste Connections for three years. I get paid by the hour for every hour I work. I got full benefits, pension, everything. You name it, I got it. I even got a uniform. I even got a locker. They give me boots, gloves, every day. Anything I need to use to work, they give it to me. It's provided to me. That's the, that's the difference between a non-union company and a union company. So if I'm, if I'm getting paid $24 an hour, why shouldn't everybody else that does the same job I do get paid the same, right? Don't you agree? That's, that's all I have to say. Got nothing else to say. Thank you for your testimony. And I think your testimony is core to what we're trying to accomplish, right? That there's obviously, um, and in your case, the waste connections of the world that are taking care of their workers and are doing good work. And we want them to be able to thrive in the city of New York. And then we have companies that, you, Viking in this case, that you had a completely different experience. And I think we're doing a better job as time has gone on at being able to distinguish between those that are doing the right thing and those that are not. And I appreciate your testimony and your statement. And I'm glad you found another job and that uh, the Teamsters were able to help you um, and Waste Connections was there. So thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, thank you so much um, to Councilmember Reynoso and to um, all the advocates who um, uh, have spoken today for this bill. I'm testifying on behalf of the New York City Environmental Justice Alliance, and my name is Dr. Tok Oyewole. Um, founded in 1991, we're a nonprofit citywide membership network linking grassroots organizations from low income neighborhoods and communities of color in their fight for environmental justice. For, you know, for the sake of time, um, I just want to um, say we're really honored to have taken part of this uh, fight for race, waste reform, and this is a, a really overdue overhaul of the system, and we think that all of the benefits people have said today and have been 
in the city's um, draft environmental impact statement, including vehicle miles traveled, um, and the resultant um, benefits to um, greenhouse gas mitigation, air pollution mitigation, um, and the uh, uh, benefits for equity and um, um, environmental justice community are, are really timely and prescient. Um, we think a few key changes to the bill can still improve its efficacy from climate and environmental justice perspectives, including adherence with environmental plans. Currently within the bill, carters must comply with the terms of some plans they submit in the RFP process, including waste reduction plan, health and safety plan, and customer service plan. However, they're not required to comply with waste management, greenhouse gas reduction, or air pollution reduction plans. Uh, the bill as drafted doesn't uh, currently mandate that carting companies submit plans to reduce particulate or greenhouse gas emissions, but legislates submission of these plans as more of an option, um, you know, if they have the plans. Um, we request that these are required criteria with which carding companies must comply, appropriately addressing the urgency and gravity of our climate crisis and environmental safety. Uh, prioritization of facility oversight. So the same level of oversight for carters must apply to facilities handling waste within this bill, including at the very least their adherence with local, state, and federal laws. Um, poor facility operations uh, are a large part of uh, the burden environmental justice communities face on top of the disproportionate amount of waste that's routed to them, and so we can't leave regulating this aspect of the waste system for later because it has already been too long. Um, increased waste diversion from landfill. Uh, we're pleased the bill requires carter submission of waste reduction plans and to strengthen this, we think it's imperative for the bill advance very rigorous waste reduction targets in line with one NYC goals of zero waste by 2030. I wanna uplift, um, uh, th this would provide further benefits for overburdened New York communities and downstream stream EJ communities. In, each, in New York, New Jersey, and other states receiving waste from our transfer stations. We can't continue to safeguard inefficient business practices at the expense of areas of the planet that have effectively been deemed disposable. In this vein, this bill has the opportunity to uplift businesses that are innovatively tackling our egregious waste generation and the climate crisis by prioritizing waste reduction and reuse. These Businesses include the zero or low emission organic waste micro haulers who provide employment to young people, people, people of color, and women. They must be allowed to scale up sustainable practices such as composting by increasing infrastructure dedicated to their work and including higher tonnage allowances in the bill. Um, regulation of subcontracting uh, as well as increased public reporting so that uh, meaningful regular public involvement can be uh, part of, uh, of Dr. this can process. You, can you just uh, wrap it up and we'll, we'll definitely have your testimony and you are part of the coalition, so we're more than happy to keep hearing your concerns. Yes, yeah. Um, thank you so much. That that was. Uh, those are the last points, and um, you you have my testimony. Thank you for your work. Thank you. And I just want to, uh, for news, if you haven't heard, the Supreme Court just struck down the citizenship question. Uh, uh, they're going to send it back to the lower court, so they won't add the citizenship question to the uh, census, which is a big deal for our community. So. So for New York, it's going to be big. So, sorry, that's a, just wanted to drop that in. Uh, uh, go Chair ahead. Chair Reynoso, Council Members Chin and Deutsch, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Eric McClure. I'm the Executive Director of Streets PAC. We're a political action committee that advocates for safe streets policies. And as such, we support the passage of Intro 1574. An exclusive waste zone program will lead to the largest possible reduction in vehicle miles traveled by commercial waste haulers, reducing overall VMT by approximately 60% versus the current non-zone system. As the Department of Sanitation stated earlier today, that would be a reduction of some 18 million miles traveled annually. This is critically important from the standpoint of safety since drivers of commercial waste vehicles have killed more than two dozen people on New York City streets over just the past five years. The current system in which different carting companies drive routes that can crisscross the entire city leads to some of the most reckless driving behaviors one can imagine. Blatant running of red lights, wrong way operation, backing up through intersections, and hazardous speeding. Anyone who's walked a street late at night in New York City has witnessed this firsthand. But private sanitation drivers don't set out to be a menace. That type of driving behavior is fed by the current dysfunctional system in which overworked crews zigzag across the city in a nightly race to complete their haphazard, disjointed routes, frequently working 12 or 14 hour shifts. An exclusive zone system will greatly rationalize this current dangerous mess. Moreover, the reduction in VMT will be even more pronounced in the densest parts of the city. An exclusive zone plan will reduce VMT in Midtown Manhattan by more than half versus a non-exclusive multi-hauler arrangement. 
There are a number of other reasons to support this legislation, uh, air quality, greenhouse gases, um, noise, but um, we're here today to support the bill because of what it will mean for the safety of New York citizens and preserving life and limb. Thanks very much. Thank you for your testimony, Eric. Ron, are you on the right panel? I don't know, <laughs> but uh, here I am. Go ahead. So. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. Better, better be on a panel, right? Yes, our panel is good enough. So thanks, and I will try not to repeat as you asked uh, earlier. My name is Ron Bergamini. I'm the CEO of Action Environmental Group, the parent company of Action Carding. Thank you, Chairman, for the opportunity to be here and, and other members. You heard it mentioned earlier that this is arguably, I think it is, the most substantial change in solid waste laws really in the history of New York. And I realize today is a bit of a hectic day. I'd, I'd urge maybe another hearing or two to tackle some of these things. This is a very difficult business. And the men and women who work, and they're mostly men at night, picking up the truck, it's a, a picking, driving the trucks and picking up this trash, that's very stressful. And we have been advocating improving standards for a long time. We're not completely convinced that the only way to do that is through zoning. However, if we're going to go that option, we believe that the single hauler uh, player is the better option. I've heard some talk about low costs. Well, is the goal simply low cost or is it policy and improving things like the environment and worker conditions and standards? If it's, no one wants to get on the airplane that the, the parts are purchased by the lowest cost, right? We can open up fresh skills if we want to really bring the rates down. It, it has to be more than that. And when you think about the, the single player, the things you could do, it's a one call system from street fairs, parades. My favorite fun one is no garbage trucks in the midtown on Wednesdays for matinee day. You could do that if you have the whole zone. Now, for those who bring up a good point about service, particularly some of the larger players, what I would urge the council or DSNY to do in the RFP Understand what those are. What are the specific concerns you have? And anyone who's going to bid has to be able to show that they can address those concerns. The last thing would be pricing. Uh, and there's a handful of things, but pricing in particular, I think it needs to be more like a San Francisco or a Seattle with a pricing menu as opposed to just one price. That will, have it, that, that will be the most transparent system, and we will have to periodically review this. I understand people want to have lower prices for recycling, but right now the recycling market is in a state of chaotic upside-downness. I don't know what you want to call it. It might not happen frequently, but it does happen. So we're proud to be part of these discussions. We want to continue to be part of them. And let's not forget, the and many of them are here, the very hardworking people in this industry. They deserve all of our thanks. And thank you. Thank you, Ron. And I just wanted two two things for you. Um, the I, I hear the when the recycling rates change and it makes it harder for folks to 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 sell their product um, right. or export it. I understand that there might have to be some conversations not to lock you into a place where it's just you can't make it happen. Um, I think there's certain ways to do that. Um, in there are cases. It, we don't necessarily need to put the burden on the business for that, but we we should. That's something we're going to talk about. I want right. to ask you a question that. Councilmember Valone asked before when you weren't, you might have been here, but he's here. not here, is language access. He says that a lot of the businesses, especially in and around his community, are extremely diverse, and they have relationships with carters that they would, they've been able to speak the language with them. In your case as a, as a carter, um, how do you navigate uh, you know, somebody that is in a Chinese-speaking community or somebody is in a Spanish-speaking community? How is it that you navigate and ensure that you're able to inform people the right way about what you're providing. Right. Uh, f first, the notion that New Yorkers don't know how to negotiate is just crazy. They all do, mm -hmm. I assure you. We have, in our case, we have several people who speak Spanish, and then we have uh, two women in particular. They speak Chinese to deal with those um, customers because there's a big enough um, population. We don't have people that speak Greek, uh, frankly. I, I haven't heard of that being a big issue. But we, we're certainly sensitive to, the, to some of the languages, and I think that's something that can be overcome. 
Yeah, I feel like if you want the business, you'll find somebody that can speak right. the language. And, and just one final point on the recycling that you mentioned. This is all all expenses go up for businesses. That's that's common, right? Two percent, three percent. The recycling isn't a matter of the prices changing by a few percents. The markets disappeared. So that's a far more fundamental change, and, and people need to be aware of that. Yes. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Uh, oh. You move to the middle. Sorry. Okay. Just hang on. Okay. Um, thank you so much for uh, for having us here. I want to thank Council Member Antonio. Uh, I believe that this country, we're kind of in a period where the, the, t the tide is coming, right? And we have to make a choice. We have to stand on the right side of history. And I want to make I want to bring it back to basics because I think that this legislation at its core is trying to address racial, economic, um, and climate and environmental injustices that communities of color have suffered for far too long. This isn't just about reforming an industry and figuring out which routes. This is not all the technical stuff we can figure out. This is about workers like Mokhtar Diallo who died. This is about workers from Sanitation Salvage who are getting paid, who were getting paid $3.81 per hour. That is outrageous. None of us can survive on $15 an hour. So when we talk about the minimum wage, we really need to be talking about an actual living wage here in New York City. I want to talk about the, this is an immigrant justice issue, and not just because it's mostly Latino, it's mostly black immigrants working in this industry. I want to talk about I want to talk about Valeria, and I want to talk about Oscar, and I want to talk about the crisis that we're facing and that we have to do everything in our hands and in our power to stop this climate crisis. People are crossing the border because we have a climate crisis in our hands. This is an issue. This is a way for us to start addressing these issues. And I wonder, when my kids grow up, are they going to ask me, did you do everything possible to mitigate this crisis, because the chances are that most of the owners of the carters uh, that are here, you know, they're kind of on their way out. And we're not, they're not going to be the worst of, they're not going to see the worst of the climate change crisis. Our kids are. And so when the difference is between 50% mild reduction and 65 or 70 mild reduction, I want us to go to 70 because we're worth it, because we need to fight for our kids. We need to fight for our future. We have so much wrongs to right, and this legislation is one of the many pieces that we can start doing here in New York City. We have to stand on the right side of history, and that's not easy. It's not easy to tell small businesses, you may have to pay a little bit more, but guess what? In 40 years, we won't be here. Thank you all so much. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you to the panel, I really appreciate it. And um, we always said it, it, saving our environment has a price and it's a price we have to pay. Um, and it's something that I've always uh, fought for, so I really appreciate your testimony. Um, so now uh, the Sergeant at Arms are gonna ask us to move over to the next room uh, so that we can transition oh, and allow excuse me. for- Can I just say one more thing? Excuse me, council member, Who's, oh, can I'm I just sorry. say one thing? <laughs> yeah. Um, you guys talk about safety and uh, you know efficiency. Uh, my company, Waste Connections, just went the month of May without a, without a single incident. If that's not safety, I don't know what is. And we're doing it again this month. So, yeah, you yeah, want safety? That's how you do Go it. With the right companies. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for that. 